Afternoon to you. It's 3 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Dobney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, the government's announced its long awaited crackdown on extremism, and Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, which he said could be investigated. And there's the extraordinary story of the Russians jamming the navigation systems of the RAF jet carrying Defence Secretary Grant Shapps and GB News reporter Ray Addison. Next up, William and Harry will appear at the same event tonight, but there's no sign whatsoever of the Royal Rift coming to an end. And there's the 101-year-old who's woman who's leading the fight to get what's been branded the most potholed road in England fixed. What an absolute trooper she is. And that's all coming up in your next hour. So welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure to have your company. Well, we were waiting a long time for this list of extremist organisations. Rishi Sunak, the other Friday, gave that emergency address. He talked about the menace of the far right, of fascism, of neo-Nazis and Britain. And many of us said, well, who are these groups? What size do they represent? What's their threat? And who are they a threat to? Well, that list came out today. Michael Gove gave us a taster of five groups more are expected to come in a few weeks' time when the full list is published. Two of those groups were far-right groups. One of them um, was disbanded in 1968. Imagine my surprise. The British National Socialist Movement hasn't existed for my entire life. What does that tell us about the state of the threat on our streets? Get in touch all the usual ways. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. But now, before all of that, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the GB newsroom. It's just gone three o'clock, and uh, as Martin was mentioning there, Michael Gove has named some of the groups that are to be investigated under a new definition of extremism announced today, which he says will mean the government can express more clearly than ever who poses a risk to Britain. The groups include the Muslim Association of Britain, CAGE and MEND, which are alleged to have Islamist views, and the British National Movement and Patriotic Alternative, which are described as neo-Nazi. Today's extremism definition will be used to assess which groups should be blocked from public funding. But Michael Gove insists it's not about silencing those with private or peaceful beliefs. We have to be clear-eyed about the threat we face, precise about where that threat comes from, and rigorous in defending our democracy. That means upholding freedom of expression, religion and belief when they are threatened, facing down harassment and hate, supporting the communities facing the greatest challenge from extremist activity, and ensuring this House and this country are safe, free and united. Well, in response to Michael Gove's statement this afternoon, some Conservative backbenchers have suggested the new definition lands in no man's land, neither strong enough to tackle true extremists or protect opposing views. Labour leader Sakia Starmer says there are new threats which must be tackled together. I think the debate about extremism uh, has to be taken very, very seriously um, because there hasn't really been a review of extremism now for a number of years. There are new threats. And uh, it is important, therefore, that um, we all come together to look at the question of extremism and what action is now needed. Uh, what I would say is that this will only work if it is truly cross-party um, and not divisive. And that's the spirit in which I want to enter uh, this discussion in relation to extremism. Some more politi political news that's come into us today. MP salaries are set to rise to £91,000 a year with a 5%, just over 5% pay rise in April. The Westminster watchdog that sets MP salaries confirmed that parliamentarians will get a boost of more than £4,700 to their basic salary. The inflation-busting 5.5% hike footed by the taxpayer is above inflation, which is currently running at 4%. Scotland's former health secretary has been found to have breached the code of conduct after an investigation into the almost £11,000 bill he racked up on a parliamentary iPad. 
Michael Matheson quit his role in the wake of the scandal over his data roaming charges, which he racked up while holidaying in Morocco over Christmas in 2022. He did later admit that his teenage sons had used the parliamentary device as a hotspot to watch football. Well, a full report into those, that spending is expected to be released in the coming months. A boy has admitted to killing 15-year-old Eliane Andam near a school in Croydon. She was stabbed to death after meeting friends on her way to school in September of last year. The 17-year-old suspect, who can't be identified because of his age, has pleaded guilty to manslaughter but denies murdering her. He'll face trial later this year. Russia has been accused of disrupting the GPS signal on the Defence Secretary's plane en route to Poland. The incident occurred as the RAF jet flew close to the edge of Kaliningrad. GPS navigation at the internet and the internet access was lost for around 30 minutes on that flight, but pilots have confirmed the aircraft was never at risk. The incident happened as Grant Shapps visited British troops participating in NATO exercises in Poland. China's foreign ministry has criticised a plan in the US to force the owner of TikTok to sell the social media app. The bill, which was passed in bipartisan support yesterday, aims to address concerns over the Chinese government's influence on the algorithm that's behind the video app, which is used by 170 million people in the US. A spokesperson for China's foreign ministry has described that plan, though, as unfair. Now, a British Airways Concorde jet is returning to its home in New York today, though it's travelling at a much slower pace than during its heyday. If you're watching on TV, you should be able to see here live pictures showing that uh, it's seen in New York where the jet is being lifted off a barge just in that bottom left-hand corner there. You can see the Concorde jet hiding away as the camera turns for us. It's already made its journey up the Hudson River and it's now returning to the Intrepid Museum in Manhattan this afternoon after a months-long restoration at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Well, the supersonic flights were retired in 2003 and it's one of 17 planes that uh, once flew from London to New York in just under two hours and 52 minutes. And something much slower now than that, as gardeners are grappling with slugs and snails, they're being urged to make peace with the slippery garden grubs. The Royal Horticultural Society is partnering with the wildlife trusts to change the perception of the creepy crawlies. They've long been seen as gardeners' worst enemies due to their appetite for chomping through the leaves of prized blooms. But out of only around 150 species, just a few apparently pose threats to gardens. Experts say they're actually an essential part of our ecosystem, feeding on rotting plants and recycling your nutrients back into the soil. Those are the latest headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. But now it's back to Martin. Great stuff. Now let's get stuck in. We've got an action-packed show ahead. And we start with the government's long-awaited clampdown on extremism. And today, Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, that would be investigated over extremism fears. Well, I'm joined now in the studio to chat over this by GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope, and Donna Jones, who's the chairwoman of the Association of Police and crime commissioners, and she really knows her onions. Chris, <coughs> let's start with you. We were been waiting for this since Rishi Sunak did that emergency address. You were you were there at yeah. Downing Street. It was broke. You were on air then too. Broke during this show, and what struck me at the time was this conflation of a tangible, provable, very real Islamist growing threat. So, booming anti-Semitism on the streets of Britain, and then um, this far-right threat. And we said at the time, OK, so what is the far-right threat? What quantity is it? Who are the groups? Today, we found out. And it's fair to say it was a bit underwhelming. One of the organisations hasn't existed since 1968. That's a British national <laughs> movement, which was known as the British National Socialist Movement. They were driven out of town by a communist riot in London in the 1960s. The other one, Patriotic Alternative, well, one of their mob was jailed for racist stickers 
last Friday. So what I'm putting to you, Chris, is how far did we get today in as far as identifying a tangible, provable threat to the public? Well, we've, we have heard, and, and good afternoon, Martin, we, we have heard, haven't we, that the, the other, they have named five different groups, two from the far right, three from the left, the Muslim Association of Britain, Cage and Mend, along with the Patrick Alternative, along with the National uh, British National Socialist Movement, which he says hasn't existed since the 60s. They'll look at all those five, they will tell us, and weigh up whether these are extremists or not. Um, this is an attempt, I think, by the government to get ahead of uh, what is a burgeoning problem since October the 7th. It may be that the issue with Islamism has risen because of the, the crisis is driven by the Middle East at the moment, and you have got the issue with the Palestinian marches, you have got the issue of Hamas and Jews, and that's, what, that's where the centre point is. And we're less seeing less about the far right at the moment, and that may be on the rise. We don't know. There are things that the um, MI5 and police know we can't always know right now. But the point is they are trying to build on this issue that, that this is, is dividing Britain, tearing us apart, and they're trying to get ahead of it. And I can understand why they're doing it. It's risky to name this, this short list. In two or three weeks' time, we'll see the full list. I think by then you can judge whether you're right in saying it's really a Zimmer's problem, not a far right one. OK, Donna Jones, I'm, I'm so happy you're in because you know what this is all about. You're operationally on the ground, you're across this, all the police forces in Britain. Can I ask you, when we look at the relative threats of the far right, the far left, Islamism, where's the hierarchy? OK, so in terms of the volume of crimes, at the moment we are seeing, you know, protesters and, and organisations who might be uh, considered to be of the left of centre definitely are the ones who are committing more of the uh, crimes and obviously the protests that are happening. I think what Michael Gove has done today is he's speaking out on behalf of the everyday man and woman in this country, the moderate people of Britain, and he's saying, you know, enough's enough. The government need to have a stance on some of these extremes that are happening in society. And I think the reference to the far there has been a small increase in the far right uh, behaviour, but let me just quantify this for you. Over the last two to three years, in my own force, for example, I would say that there has been probably um, around 10, uh, 10 incidents on the far right in, in my patch in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Around 10. And over what, the kind last... of, what kind of things were they? Do you mind me asking? Um, mostly um, protests um, in counteracting a pro Palestinian protest, for example, when they know that there's going to be some people perhaps of an extreme nature there. So it wasn't like a Attacks on mosques or, no, or, or physical no. attacks on mosques. No, it's been in response to um, another protest. Okay, um, and they've been largely peaceful, and there haven't been a huge problem. Um, the volume of the protests that have happened, um, perhaps in the more moderate centre and to the left, clearly we're seeing those happening much more frequently. I think the key thing here is that people have a right to freedom of speech. Yeah. You, can, you even are in. It's not illegal to have thoughts of an extreme nature. What the government are trying to say here, they're not bringing in new legislation today. What Michael goes is clearly saying is that if you try and in, insinuate or you try and um, encourage, I should say, any kind of division, any kind of breakup of community cohesion, if you are promoting or you are an organisation that's promoting hate crimes in Britain today, it's not right, it's got to stop, and clearly the government are, are concerned about extremes in society growing. OK, good. Well, let's have a quick listen to what Michael Gove said earlier at that announcement in Parliament. The United Kingdom is a success story. A multinational, multi ethnic, multi faith democracy stronger because of our diversity. But our democracy and our values of inclusivity and tolerance are under challenge. So we hear that phrase a lot we're stronger through our diversity, but we are becoming very divided along lines of religion, ostensibly. That's what this is about since October the 7th, isn't it? This is an, an issue, ostensibly, correct if I'm wrong. Um, between um, those who are pro-Palestine and the Jewish people. And then we have the hard left coming in, and as you said, the hard, the far right, whatever you want to call them, mm. counter-protesting. And that's why we're seeing an uplift generally. But on the balance of probabilities, the threat, the greatest threat, is from where? I would say in terms of the volume of, uh, the, of, of the two extremes, it's coming from the left in terms of the volume. Um, but what you tend to find, whilst they are much more infrequent in terms of the far right, they actually um, can often be slightly more violent. Um, but actually, the volume of things that are going on are coming more from, from I would say, from left of centre and from the far left. But what we do have to remember is let's just take, for example, these protests in London every two weeks, these pro-Palestinian protests, OK? 
The vast majority, 99% of the people that are there are lawful. They turn up with lawful intentions. They're exercising their right to freedom of speech. However, and it's always the minority that cause the problem, and the minority who are from the far left on those protests every two weeks in London, they are the ones that are potentially damaging this for all of those lawful people that want to be there exercising their right to a ceasefire in Gaza, let's say. Just to be absolutely clear, so if a young British Muslim lad clambers on a war memorial... Is that classified as a left-wing crime or is that something different? Um, I mean, it depends on the context of it, but I would say uh, no. I think that if you are chanting a hate <laughs> slogan um, on a protest um, outside a mosque or, uh, you know, you're saying from the river to the sea and you are chanting that when you know that there are Jewish people around or it's chanted in a way that is, you know, due to cause, you're, you're intending to cause offence, of course that's a hate crime. Um, whether that would be deemed far left or not, you'd have to speak to the police about that. I'm a police and crime commissioner. Um, I oversee the governance of policing and uh, set the um, this strategy and the policy for my force, yeah. but obviously that is an operational police officer's um, call on whether or not that would be deemed to be far left or not. No, I'm, I'm extremely grateful mm. for you setting mm. this out, because I just think we want some yeah. clarity, don't yeah. mm. I think people just want clarity. And it shows to me how hard it is to, 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 to enforce the law, because we've had people on air, haven't we, here, saying, yeah. why can't yeah. the government take control of the policing, or why were the police standing by? And those words were put on, on the Big Ben column. You saw, you saw the actual um, projector, Martin, and you on Twitter you were saying, why is it there? Why why is the police not yes, throwing a... 14 a... minutes on, on Parliament Square on the green. And I actually went to the meeting at number 10 on the Wednesday afterwards, chaired by the Prime Minister. Yeah. Um, and, of course, that came up in conversation. Why was from the... Well, why was it? We don't know. Well, I mean, it was it, there was no-one manning it. It was put up, the projector, on the grass. It was there. It projected for 14 minutes well, I was it there. was removed. I went over and said to the coppers, there's the projector, go and, go and nick them. Yes. They had no interest. But, yeah. why, but why wouldn't? Yeah, why didn't they nick him? <laughs> well, um, I don't. I think the ongo the investigation is ongoing as to who put it there, who pushed the button, mm. who was responsible. Mm. Um, but of course, those sorts. Well, they of could things... have frowned. They'd come over with me because I showed them the video. They had no interest on it. And before we move on, we have to have a quick look at what Sakia Starmer said about this earlier. I think the debate about extremism uh, has to be taken very, very seriously um, because there hasn't really been a review of extremism now for a number of years. There are new threats, and uh, it is important, therefore, that um, we all come together to look at the question of extremism and what action is now needed. Uh, what I would say is that this will only work if it is truly cross-party um, and not divisive. And that's the spirit in which I want to enter uh, this discussion in relation to extremism. And, Donald Jones, you, you were nodding vociferously there at what Sakir Storm was saying. This only works if everybody buys into it. Well, look, I don't very often agree with Sakir Starmer. I'm a Conservative. But actually, on this point, he's absolutely bang on the money. It has to be cross-party. Um, any division here is not helpful. And actually, we saw Amber Rudd, Sajid Javid and Preeti Patel, three of our four previous Home Secretaries, put out a joint statement yesterday saying just what Sakir Starmer has said. It has to be together. No political division here. Let's get behind it. He's absolutely right. We need it for the safety of Britain. Hallelujah. What a fantastic first guest you've been, Donna Jones. Please, please come back. I will. I don't reckon that was just brilliant. Well, clarity, because what, what, what a lot of people have been worrying our viewers and listeners is why can't the police enforce the law? And you're describing or trying to describe how hard that can be. And that's really fascinating from hearing from you, Donna. Donna. Great stuff, great stuff. Love it. Thank you very much. Please come in again. Great start to the show. Now, spring is in the air, so is your chance to win a garden gadgets package, a shopping spree, and an incredible £12,345, one, two, three, four, five, tax free in Moolah. And here's how you could get your hands on all of that lot. We've got cash, treats and a spring shopping spree to be won in a great British giveaway. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 
Great stuff gets stuck in. Now, Grant Shapps has given GB News an exclusive TV interview in which he said, we're living in more dangerous times. So why is our army now less than half the size it was in 1990? In fact, the smallest army since the Napoleonic times. You couldn't make it up. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictably went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a cruise that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the king was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, throughout all these families, I see it on a day-to-day on -day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the, the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Mm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word, so inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussexes' stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the king is ill, Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father, as far as we know. And Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. It's 3.23. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. A cracking start to the show so far. And a little later this hour, I'll discuss Rishi Sunak's call to boost gas capacity. And I'll ask if the Prime Minister wants to do that, then why are we hitting energy firms with massive windfall taxes and banging on about net zero? Now, in a moment, we'll bring you a TV exclusive with Grant Shamps. But first, to the incredible story that Russia has been accused of disrupting the satellite GPS on the Defence Secretary's plane as he flew to Poland yesterday. And the plane was also carrying GB News reporter Ray Addison. Now, it's understood the GPS signal was blocked for around 30 minutes as the RAF jet flew close to the edge of Kaliningrad, a Russian enclave between Lithuania and Poland. Well, the flight lost GPS navigation and internet access on the outbound and the return journey. Well, Mr Shapps was assured by pilots that the safety of the aircraft was never at risk. Well, I'm now also joined by former Labour Defence Minister Bill Rammel. Bill, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Bill. So, 
Is this um, a, an act of hostility, jamming the signals on RAF jets, carrying the defence sector? It's hardly cricket. I think it's very concerning. And uh, I think immediately we need to get to the bottom of exactly what happened and how it happened. Now, from the reports, it seems that uh, the defence secretary and the journalist, journalist accompanying him were not at risk. But it is really, really concerning and underlines the degree of challenge and threat we face from Russia's military ambitions. And I think there needs to be an investigation and identify, you know, was it a mistake? Was it because um, the plane was flying close to the Russian border? Or was it a deliberate attack? And if it is, then, then we need to respond very robustly. It might have been the case, Bill, that this was like a blanket jamming device that they put out to any craft of unknown origin in the area or something more nefarious, a more targeted, impacted um, attack, if you like, upon a British RF jet carrying, as we just said, the Defence Minister. Well, the benign interpretation is that it's a general jamming device that would hit all aircraft flying close uh, to the Russian border. Um, but, you know, given the actions of the Russians, you know, uh, in a range of areas, you know, given that they've actually assassinated people, you go back to the Salisbury poisoning, assassinated people in the UK, you really have to be concerned. And that's why I think there needs to be a thoroughgoing investigation to get to the bottom of it. And it if it was a deliberate attack on the Defence Secretary's plane, then we need to re re respond very robustly. And, Bill, in the days before the Ukraine war, this may have been a huge diplomatic incident, but now Putin is already um, the kind of persona non grata of the Western world. So will it make much difference between Russian and British relationships? Well, I think the, uh, the state of Russia, its ambitions and the threat that it presents is one of the most deeply concerning things um, in the world in which we live. Uh, at the moment. You know, when I was a defence minister, when I was a foreign minister, we had a dialogue, we had a relationship with the Russians. But, you know, over the, particularly the last four or five years, uh, Russia has moved in a really dangerous uh, direction. And, you know, we're talking on the day of the fraudulent Russian presidential election, um, where, you know, Putin is going to be re-elected uh, with probably 70 percent of the vote, uh, and it is a fraud. The, you know, there's no real candidates against him. You know, uh, the government uh, gerrymanders uh, the media ecosystem, um, and, it, and it's really worrying. And there needs to be a robust response from the whole international community. Um, you know, one of the things I'm very worried about is Donald Trump's statements where he said that, you know, uh, if, if NATO countries aren't committing to a certain level of defence expenditure, and I want them to commit to those levels, that he'd say to the Russians, well, go and get them. You know, that kind of leadership in the West, within NATO, uh, would be really, really concerning. OK, thanks for your time. Always a pleasure. Former Labour Defence Minister Bill Rammel on GB News there. Now, as promised, to that interview now with Grant Shamps. And he's urged also Donald Trump not to abandon Ukraine if he becomes US president again. And Mr Shamps has also told our reporter Ray Addison that we should increase spending on defence to 3%. Well, look, I think it's undeniably a more dangerous world. We've got a war in Europe. We've got a conflict in the Middle East. You've seen uh, the UK uh, involved in the Middle East uh, with, the, with the Houthis. So I think it's important that we uh, we up our spending. We are committed to 2.5%. I note that Labour uh, say they're committed to the 2% figure. That's already a £7 billion cut from where we're up to now. Um, so they are not the answer. Uh, and as you say, I, I've, I've rightly, I think, called for more money. I should just say that this budget actually has added 1.8% in real terms to our defence budgets. And obviously, Putin uh, has been gaining ground in Ukraine. How much of a threat currently is Russia? And could you see the UK and other NATO countries being forced into some kind of armed conflict? So I was over in uh, Ukraine last week. I met President Zelensky. When I was there, I, I said, this is a wake-up call for the world. You've got some Russian advances, as you say. They're not dramatic in truth, but nonetheless, they're consistent at the moment. It is very important and will cost us a lot less money if we understand that defeating Russia uh, and Putin 
uh, in Ukraine is a lot less expensive than him moving further to the west, either to the rest of Ukraine or, 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 or worse still, to places like Poland. So we've recently um, announced the purchase of 14 uh, new Chinook uh, helicopters. Uh, what, why do we need them? They're obviously, uh, we know that they've got extra features that the previous uh, fleet did not have. So what, why, what makes them different and what makes them better? Well, first of all, we've got a very good deal on them. I should say we've, we've saved about £300 million on these and uh, uh, also got some other reforms in the purchasing system, which will save a lot of money in the future. Uh, so these have now become a much better value. These 14 are extended range uh, Chinook helicopters. Uh, they're the most capable heavy lift helicopters in the world. Uh, this particular version of it will enable us to do some very important work, not all of which I'm afraid I can talk about publicly, but it is important that we carry on modernising our armed forces. Just going looking at America now, obviously um, presidential election is, is underway and Donald Trump is the Republican presumptive uh, nominee for that. It possibly could be in the White House uh, by 2025. Um, and we've just heard from Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. He met Donald Trump. He said that uh, Mr Trump would not fund Ukraine if he became president of the United States. Does that concern you? Do, what message would you send to Donald Trump? Well, I think it's actually really very straightforward. There's one thing that Donald Trump definitely doesn't want to see. It's other leaders looking at the West, coming to the conclusion, and America, that it uh, won't step up when it comes to it. And perhaps in two or three years, you'll get sort of bored and disaffected and leave that battle behind. And I think when it comes to things that Trump himself says he really cares about, Taiwan being an obvious example, uh, the clearest single message to send to anyone who thought that uh, force was the way to reunify uh, would be to abandon Ukraine. We do currently have a real world crisis in the Red Sea. People will understandably perhaps question uh, why we haven't seen an aircraft carrier there to conduct strikes on the Houthis rather than flying typhoons on 3,000 mile bombing round trips from Cyprus. What would you say to them? If I needed the aircraft carrier there, I would have sent it there. There was actually no uh, logistical advantage in doing that. Uh, and uh, the reality of the situation is that uh, even when America went and bombed the Iran-aligned militias the other week in Syria and uh, Iraq, you know where they flew those uh, from? Not from the aircraft carrier, which they did actually have in the Red Sea, but all the way from the United States, which is a heck of a lot further uh, than flying the typhoons from uh, its base to that, those targets. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock. William and Harry will both appear at an event paying tribute to their late mother, Princess Diana, tonight. But get this, Harry will only be involved once his brother has left. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia Wenzer. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. Your top story at 3.32. Michael Gove has named some of the groups to be investigated under a new definition of extremism, which he says will mean the government can express more clearly than ever who poses a risk to Britain. The groups include the Muslim Association of Britain, CAGE and MEND, which are alleged to have Islamist views, and the British National Movement and Patriotic Alternative, which are described as neo-Nazi. Today's new extremism definition will be used to assess which groups should be blocked from public funding. But the community secretary insists it's not about silencing those with private and peaceful beliefs. Scotland's former health secretary has been found to have breached the code of conduct after an investigation into the £11,000 bill on a parliamentary iPad. Michael Matheson quit his role in the wake of a scandal over his data roaming charges, which he racked up while holidaying in Morocco over Christmas in 2022. He later admitted that his teenage sons used the device as a hotspot to watch football. A full report into his spending is expected to be released in the coming months. MPs are getting a pay rise with an inflation-busting 5.5% boost, pushing salaries to around £91,000. It means pay will increase by more than £4,700 next year, or almost £400 extra each month. The Westminster watchdog says in line with an award for senior civil servants, but it's above inflation, which is just 4%. Russia has been accused of disrupting the GPS signals on a Defence Secretary's RAF jet. The incident occurred as the plane flew close to the edge of Kaliningrad en route to Poland to visit NATO troops. 
GPS navigation and internet access was lost for around 30 minutes during the flight, but the pilots have confirmed the aircraft was never at risk. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2744 and €1.1699. The price of gold is £1,695.80 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,728 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Sophia. Now, our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says we've got to boost our gas capacity to give us energy security. But at the same time, why on earth is the government hitting firms with massive 75% windfall taxes? It simply doesn't add up. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Absenteeism and parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. Mm. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm mm. going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently were, uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Yeah. So how could, you know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months. But if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know, taking great measures well to, i think know, one of their punishing. plans is to have a national register hmm. which, 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 would, which would help with that which would definitely help but i think it's it's almost it's you can't well, they can't deal with the real problem so they're going after it's... actually perfectly you know decent parents who are just taking the odd day off you know for to save money frankly Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel.
Welcome back. The time is 3.39 and you're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later in the show, I'll discuss the controversial decision that saw the Labour MP who used the phrase between the river and the sea at a pro-Palestine rally have the whip restored. But before that, Rishi Sunak says it's not possible to protect national security without delivering energy security following the complications the Ukraine war has caused. The Prime Minister stresses the government's mission for the UK to stand on its own feet, having halted Russian energy imports, boosting domestic production and continuing to hit those net zero targets. Well, joining me now to discuss this in the studio is the peerless GB News' economics and business editor, Captain Liam Halligan. Liam. You've been saying this for absolutely... Captain. Ever. Captain. Yeah, you've been, you've been promoted. <laughs> <laughs> you've been saying this forever and a day. Um, to be dependent on, on, on national security, you need to be dependent on energy security. Um, and yet, at the same time, we seem to have these draconian net zero targets allied to punishing windfall taxes on gas production. Never the twain shall meet. Rishi finally saying... We need more gas. Well, before Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, Martin, I must say energy security, energy policy, it was one of the nerdiest subjects mm. in terms of the sort of things I talk about on television. Um, energy policy is very complicated. Our energy mix is very complicated. What's important, though, is that uh, at the turn of the century, 30-odd percent of our electricity came from coal-fired power stations. Now it's less than 2 percent. Mm. Renewables are much, much more. But those renewables are expensive because you have to have gas-fired power stations on standby for when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Yep. That's really expensive to have those gas-fired power stations on standby doing nothing most of the time. They've got to be manned, they've got to be maintained. And then the cost of all that is spread over all other energy. So... Our electricity in the UK, because we have lots of renewables, is very, very expensive. It's much, much more expensive than the EU average and far, far more expensive than in the United States. So the term cheap renewables, it doesn't really stack up when you haven't got other baseload supplies to replace renewables when you need them or until you can store renewable energy effectively. Now, the Prime Minister, this is his second intervention in this area so far this week. He said earlier this week... We've got 32 gas-fired power stations in the UK. And he yeah. said we're going to need more. A lot of them are being retired over the next five to ten years. He says a Tory government will build many, many more. Uh, a lot of environmentalists said, oh, my God, that's terrible, that's terrible. Um, but Labour were quite ambivalent because they are now understanding that the public wants us, or a lot of members of the public, they, they want a cleaner planet. They want less pollution. I think a lot of people understand that we need to move away from fossil fuels but the costs of doing that mm. in terms of you know, pounds, shillings and pence to ordinary people and the costs in terms of our energy security yeah. are big. And uh, finally, 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 mainstream politicians are starting to recognise this. And finally, we can talk about it without being called climate deniers or barbaric just because we understand a little bit mm. about energy policy in this country and, and the realities. And in the Telegraph article today, Rishi Sunak made the statement that you said at the beginning of this item. You can't protect national security without delivering energy security. And he's sort of doubled down on this pledge, trying to push, put more pressure on Labour to say we do need more gas-fired power stations. And yet, the missing equation from this, again, we talk about this so often, Liam, is that we're importing most of this gas from around the world. 19 billion quid's worth last year. We did a whopping trade deal yesterday with Texas. Mm. Of course, its biggest exports being petroleum products and gas, why don't we just drill baby drill and do it ourselves? Well, of course, we have got the North Sea uh, oil and gas complex. You know, Aberdeen in Scotland is probably the energy production capital of Europe, but a lot of those North Sea fields are now spent or they're too difficult to access with current technology. Having said that, there still is a lot of production in the North Sea. We are a net oil and gas importer, as you rightly say, Martin, but there still is a lot of production going on in the North Sea. And that's why the message from Rishi Sunak today slightly jars yeah. with what we saw in the budget and what we've seen since Russia invaded Ukraine. You know, before that invasion in February 22, before energy prices really spiked, 
the oil and gas industry would pay 40% corporation tax, so 40% tax on its profits, compared to it was 19 and it's 25 for all other companies. That went up to 65 and then to 75 in, with the so-called windfall tax. And in, in the budget earlier this month, Jeremy Hunt extended that windfall tax from, from 2027. It's now going to last until 2028, so that's piling pressure on often small businesses that are drilling in the North Sea for oil and gas. They're often British companies. They're not the massive global energy companies anymore in the North Sea, not really. They're often small British companies, heavily indebted, yeah. and they need every... You know, they need those profits in order to, to plough them back into the business and grow their way out of their debt burden. But, look, this is the reality. We currently rely on oil and gas for 75% of our energy needs in this country, mm. when you include transportation as well as electricity. And even the Climate Change Commission, the government's sort of in-house conscience, a sort of green campaigning group within government, even they acknowledge that 2030, on the best estimates of how good renewables are going to be, it's still going to be 50% oil and gas. Mm. And even by 2050... 25% of our energy needs will be oil and gas. So we need oil and gas. It's just axiomatically yeah. true under the most environmentally friendly scenarios. So I guess what the Prime Minister's finally getting his head round is what quite a lot of us have been saying for many, many years. We do need oil and gas to some degree, even if we're going to use less. So if we're going to use oil and gas, let's use our own, yeah. because we then get the tax revenue on it. It's more energy secure... Foreign governments can't take it away from us for geopolitical reasons, and it employs tens of thousands, mm. hundreds of thousands of people in this country. You know, ask the GMB, the second biggest union in this country, what they think of Labour's plans to increase the windfall tax on North Sea oil and yeah. gas even more. You know, their unofficial view is not fit for family viewing. Yeah, Liam Halligan... Channeling common sense, it'll never catch on. <laughs> Superb as ever. Now, still to come, I'll have news of an event this evening where William and Harry will both appear, but find out why there's no thawing in relations between the two princes. But first, in a GB News series, Innovation Britain, we are looking at the successes of British manufacturing around the country. We've come to the oldest borough in England, it's Malmesbury. That's correct, King Athelstan's uh, gaff. Um, if we would have had the Thames, I think we would have been in London, but unfortunately we're not. Unfortunately, but, yeah. we're not in London, no, we're in Malmesbury. And it might be one of the oldest places in the UK, but yeah. we've got actually a really brand new product here, Chris. Yeah. What, what have you guys designed? Absolutely, so Sweden and Bradley, so we work, we are a subcontract cheap metal company, but we're actually looking into making our own products now. Um, this is a manhole guardian, so it's an arrest device to fit inside the manhole cover when you're working on it. So it will literally clamp inside the chamber of the manhole, enable people to still access, but more importantly, not fall into the manhole, um, which does happen. Um, it, we actually developed this because we work on defib cabinets, we manufacture defib cabinets, we manufacture bleed kits. Um, so it was a natural step for us to look into the safety industry. Um, the problem arose, um, we took a concept, so we took a very rudimentary concept, uh, which was some uh, mild steel, you know, rust, rusty old mild steel box section. And then we actually used uh, Radquote and all of our software to be able to develop. I think it's quite a sexy product, uh, but maybe, you know, sexy to me is not sexy to others. But it's, it's a great looking product. It's lightweight. It's safe. You know, I mean, it'll, it will stop lots of accidents and huge potential for the utilities industry, water boards, construction, any, anywhere there's a manhole. UK is, you know, we should be making more as the UK. I'm a huge advocate for UK engineering. I think I explained to you earlier on, I've seen UK engineering go away offshore at times. I'm seeing it come back now. So it's important that companies like Sweetham and Bradley, there's lots of them out there, can actually do their own thing as well. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More heavy downpours to come tomorrow. It won't rain all day. There will be some brighter spells and another pretty mild day in the south. But, uh, you know, it's not going to be completely dry when low pressure is dominating. This one's sitting right over as these weather fronts have been providing persistent rain through the day. It stays very soggy overnight across central and southern Scotland. Showers elsewhere and some decent drier spells developing over the Midlands and eastern England before more heavy 
heavy showers coming to Wales and southwest England through the early hours. Could be the odd rumble of thunder mixed in with that and the winds gusting up as well. A very mild night for most, but um, a bit chilly in northern Scotland where a touch of frost is just about possible. A, a cold start then with the rain over a good part of Scotland, although not as heavy as today. It stays pretty dull and damp through southeast Scotland for most of the day. Elsewhere, it'll be a case of bright spells and some showers, some heavy showers, particularly early on and then later on through the afternoon across eastern England. Some brightness, though, for Northern Ireland, west coast of Scotland, on the chilly side here, whereas in the south, again, into the teens, a bit of brightness in eastern England, could see highs of 15 or 16. Temperature dropping there on Friday night. So Saturday starts with a frost for many. I suspect much of eastern England, northern England, Scotland will stay dry on Saturday. Further west, the cloud thickening all the while with outbreaks of rain trickling in. Again, reasonably mild in the south, although don't forget, it will be a bit of a chilly start. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 3.52. You're watching or listening to Martin Dordme <clears throat> by me on GB News. Now, Prince William and Prince Harry will both appear at an event honouring their late mother tonight. But if you were hoping that it could be the start of a thawing in relations between the two brothers, well, I'm afraid you're going to be sorely disappointed. And to discuss this, I'm now joined by GB News' royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Cameron, so the two brothers, the same event, but not um, even in each other's company. But what's William been up to today? Yeah, well, Prince William obviously has this uh, Diana Awards tonight, which we'll talk about in a minute. But he's actually been at a youth zone in West London where he's expressed concern about the amount of time people are spending on their mobile phones, both children and adults. Now, the reason this is significant is because a lot of people across the country and indeed the world over the last two, three weeks uh, have been looking at conspiracy, unfounded conspiracy theories about the Princess of Wales's health. Now, there's no suggestion that Prince William was directly referring to those kind of conspiracy theories online, but nonetheless, the fact he is voicing concerns about mobile phones uh, could perhaps uh, speak volumes, particularly since he's got three young children himself uh, who clearly are going to in the next few years get to the age where they themselves will probably have mobile phones and their peers and I'm sure Prince William is very concerned about how they will be portrayed or filmed on social media at some point but when it comes to uh, what's happening tonight him and his brother Prince Harry will be attending uh, the Diana Legacy Awards it was awards set up to to honor the memory of Princess Diana and her views that young people have the power to change the world but there's a rift, isn't there, between William and Harry. Prince William will be there in person at the Science Museum in London uh, later uh, this evening. But Prince Harry isn't appearing until Prince William's left. And he will be appearing virtually, understandably, because he's in California. But nonetheless, this 25th anniversary year of this award, honouring the legacy of Princess Diana and the two brothers, their rift, no sign of it getting any better. Yeah, and it's all very sad, isn't it, really, Cameron? You know, the, what, what their mother would think looking down upon them. Cameron Walker, thank you very much for joining us on the show. 
Now, Government Minister Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, which could be checked against the government's new definition of extremism. We'll have the full detail on that after this. Those, those two groups from the far right, those three groups from the Islamist end of the spectrum will drill into the details. Who's behind them? What size is the threat? Should we be concerned? And all the full political reaction, including from Sakir Starmer and London Mayor Sadiq Khan, who says it's dividing communities. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. The first time for your weather with Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More heavy downpours to come tomorrow. It won't rain all day. There will be some brighter spells and another pretty mild day in the south. But, uh, you know, it's not going to be completely dry when low pressure is dominating. This one's sitting right over as these weather fronts have been providing persistent rain through the day. It stays very soggy overnight across central and southern Scotland. Showers elsewhere and some decent drier spells developing over the Midlands and eastern England before more heavy showers come into Wales and southwest England through the early hours. Could be the odd rumble of thunder mixed in with that and the winds gusting up as well. A very mild night for most, but um, a bit chilly in northern Scotland where a touch of frost is just about possible. A, a cold start then with the rain over a good part of Scotland, although not as heavy as today. It stays pretty dull and damp through southeast Scotland for most of the day. Elsewhere, it'll be a case of bright spells and some showers, some heavy showers, particularly early on and then later on through the afternoon across eastern England. Some brightness, though, for Northern Ireland, west coast of Scotland, on the chilly side here, whereas in the south, again, into the teens, a bit of brightness in eastern England, could see highs of 15 or 16. Temperature dropping now on Friday night. So Saturday starts with a frost for many. I suspect much of eastern England, northern England, Scotland will stay dry on Saturday. Further west, the cloud thickening all the while with outbreaks of rain trickling in. Again, reasonably mild in the south, although don't forget, it will be a bit of a chilly start. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner? You've won £18,000. I'm slipping neck. I don't know what to say. Enter our massive spring giveaway with three big seasonal prizes to be won. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. A very good afternoon to you all out there. It's 4 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up in your next hour, the government's announced its long way to crack down on extremism. And Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, which he said could and should be investigated. Next, teens online make a shock revelation with groups admitting to doing their relatives' nursing degree coursework. Could underqualified medics be putting British people's lives in jeopardy? We'll have a full report on that. I'll also discuss the controversial decision by Labour to restore the whip to Andy MacDonald, the MP for Middlesbrough, after he referenced an anti-Semitic hate chant. And there's the 101-year-old woman who's leading the fight to get what's been branded the most potholed road in England fixed. What an absolute trooper she is. And that's all coming up between now and 6 o'clock. Welcome to the show. It's always an absolute pleasure to have your company. Well, since Rishi Sunak gave that emergency um, address to the nation on the steps of Downing Street a couple of weeks ago on a Friday, we've been waiting to see who the threats to Britain were in terms of the extremist groups. We found out a little more detail today from Michael Gove. Five groups were identified, three um, from the Muslim end of the spectrum, as it were, and two from the far right. But we're delving into the detail of the actual threat that's represented by those relative groups. Do you think that the far-right threat is being revved up? We're still waiting for details on one of the groups, the British National Socialist Movement, that was quoted by Michael Gove today in Parliament as a threat, was actually disbanded in 1968. Its two leaders are long dead. Let me know what you think about all of this. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past four. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Michael Gove has named some of the groups to be investigated under a new definition of extremism, which he says will mean the government can express more clearly than ever who poses a risk to Britain. The groups include the Muslim Association of Britain, CAGE and MEND, which are alleged to have Islamist views, and the British National Movement and Patriotic Alternative, which are described as neo-Nazi. Today's new extremism definition will be used to assess which groups should be blocked from public funding, but Michael Gove insists it's not about silencing those with private and peaceful beliefs. We have to be clear-eyed about the threat we face, precise about where that threat comes from, and rigorous in defending our democracy. That means upholding freedom of expression, religion and belief when they are threatened, facing down harassment and hate, supporting the communities facing the greatest challenge from extremist activity, and ensuring this House and this country are safe, free and united. Some Conservative backbenchers have suggested the new definition lands in no-man's land, neither strong enough to tackle true extremists nor to protect opposing views. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says there are new threats which must be tackled together. I think the debate about extremism uh, has to be taken very, very seriously. 
um, because there hasn't really been a review of extremism now for a number of years. There are new threats and uh, it is important therefore that um, we all come together to look at the question of extremism and what action is now needed. Uh, what I would say is that this will only work if it is truly cross-party um, and not divisive. And that's the spirit in which I want to enter uh, this discussion in relation to extremism. Now, MPs are getting a pay rise with an inflation-busting 5.5% boost, pushing salaries to around £91,000. It means pay will increase by more than £4,700 next year, or almost £400 extra each month. The Westminster watchdog says it's in line with an award for senior civil servants, but it's above inflation, which is just 4%. Scotland's former health secretary has been found to have breached the code of conduct after an investigation into the £11,000 bill he racked up on a parliamentary iPad. Michael Matheson quit his role in the wake of the scandal over his data roaming charges, which he racked up while holidaying in Morocco over Christmas in 2022. He later admitted that his teenage sons used the parliamentary device as a hotspot to watch football. A full report into his spending is expected to be released in the coming months. A boy has admitted killing 15-year-old Eliane Andam near a school in Croydon. She was stabbed to death after meeting friends on her way to school in September. The 17-year-old suspect, who can't be identified because of his age, has pleaded guilty to manslaughter but denies murdering her. He'll face trial later this year. Russia has been accused of disrupting the GPS signal on the Defence Secretary's plane en route to Poland. The incident occurred as the RAF jet flew close to the edge of Kaliningrad. GPS navigation and internet access was lost for around 30 minutes during the flight, but the pilots have confirmed the aircraft was never at risk. The incident happened as Grant Shapps visited British troops participating in NATO exercises in Poland. The Prince of Wales has expressed concerns about the amount of time children spend on phones as he's visited a youth club today. He was visiting a new £12 million centre called West, which stands for When Everyone Sticks Together. The Prince asked some of the children how long they spend on their phones, with one girl saying she spends up to 15 hours a day. The future King said grown-ups were also guilty of excessive screen time and said we've all got to get better at managing it. And a British Airways Concorde jet is returning to its home in New York today, though it's travelling at a much slower pace than during its heyday. If you're watching on TV, you can see these live pictures now coming to us from New York. The jet was lifted off a barge just moments ago after its journey up the Hudson River. It's returning to their intrepid museum in Manhattan this afternoon after a month's long restoration at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The supersonic flights were retired in 2003 and it's one of 17 planes that once flew from London to New York in just 2 hours and 52 minutes. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Martin. Now, we start this hour with the government's long-awaited clampdown on extremism. And Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, that would be investigated over extremism fears. And I'm joined in our Westminster studio by our political editor, Chris Hope, and also by Tom Wilson, who's the director at, of policy at the Counter Extremism Group. Good afternoon to both of you, gents. Let's start with you, Chris. So, since Rishi Sunak gave that emergency address on the steps of the Anastasia, you were there, of course. It yeah. broke during my show. Um, the far right was thrown out there as something we should be concerned about. At that time, we were saying, OK, so let's quantify that. How big is the threat? Who is the threat at? And likewise, with the Islamist threat. We got a bit more detail today. Five groups were named. Not the full shebang. That will come in a few weeks' well, the, time. The full shebang is where I think you'll find the controversy. So he named two far-right groups in the House of Commons today, um, Patriotic Alternative and the British National S uh, Socialist Movement. 
three others named on the, on the Islamist side or the or the left of the side, he would describe it, the Muslim Association of, Association of Britain, Cage and Men. Now, he was saying none of those have done, done not being not corporate, corporate extremists at this stage, have been looked at by this new, under this new guidelines from the Michael Gove to, uh, set out today in House of Commons. And it may be they are uh, called extremists in the future, in three weeks, and other groups may be tied into that. What, you, what the idea here is they're trying to strangle the funding for groups that they feel should, shouldn't get public money. So once you're called an extremist in one of those groups, you can't then get central government money. And that may then have a bearing on whether you get charity money, because any trustees will look at that. Well, if they say the government says you're extremist, we can't give you money. So mm. trustees will govern themselves. Some of these groups have received charitable funds in the past. It's an attempt to build on what, as you say, the PM, Richie Sunak, said about this, uh, this extre uh, the extremism is tearing this country apart. And they're trying to say it's from both sides. But recently, we have seen more... Um, issues with the Islamist side because of the issues in, on October 7th, the attack on Israel. OK, well, let's go now to Tom. Um, Tom Wilson, five groups were thrown out there today and I was surprised by the fact the British National Socialist Movement hasn't even existed since the 1960s. It was disbanded and Patriots Alternative, um, I think the biggest crime they've been guilty of is one of their members was jailed for racist stickers a couple of weeks ago. On the other end of the spectrum, some rather serious stuff from CAGE, the Muslim Association of Britain, and also Muslim Engagement and Discipline. What can you tell us about those three groups? Well, I think that the groups that uh, were being talked about today and the whole uh, subject of this new definition, what they want to focus on is to do with much more people who are in the non-violent space. And there's clearly a threat to this country and our democracy from a couple of different angles. There's the terrorist threat, mm. and then there's the threat of uh, people intimidating MPs, intimidating yes. journalists, turning up outside schools and demonstrating because they don't agree with what a teacher is teaching. Mm -hmm. And that clearly infringes on people's civil liberties and their free speech. So this new initiative is primarily trying to deal with that. <coughs> Something like Prevent would deal more with uh, the threat mm. from terrorism and violence. OK. I think it's clear, it's really important that we try and establish a relative threat or a hierarchy, at least if we can, in terms of this. We've seen a huge boom in anti-Semitic crime since October the 7th. That's clearly linked to the Islamist spectrum, the end of it. That's fair to say, isn't it? Um, in terms of the far right, how big a threat is it? I mean, and what about the far left? What about anarchist groups? This is a complex group of people who pose a threat. Absolutely. So if you're talking about terrorism and we actually look at the number of attacks that have happened from the far right or the number of people who have been killed in far right attacks, the threat is comparatively really quite small compared to the Islamist threat, which is the main terrorist threat facing this country. And there's also a very small far left terrorist threat. But if we're talking about extremist groups, as I think we're now looking at today particularly, then yes, you do need to broaden out particularly to the far left. You mentioned October the 7th. It is Islamist groups who are very prominent in much of the activities, and we've seen extremist preaching in mosques, for instance. But the far left has also had a part in this as well, intimidating MPs, making MPs feel unsafe. Um, GB News uh, reporters, I believe, down at some of the protests yeah. were mm. being intimidated. Catherine Falls um, got it, yeah. So groups that cause vandalism, mass disruption, are much closer to the anarchist end of the spectrum. And hopefully a definition like this would also look at those groups too. And when we can't... Chris, can well, I can say it's worth, worth hearing what Michael Gove had to say about that very point earlier. Precisely. The United Kingdom is a success story. A multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy stronger because of our diversity. But our democracy and our values of inclusivity and tolerance are under challenge. And why don't we quickly look at what Sir Keir Starmer had to say, his reaction to today's announcements earlier. I think the debate about extremism uh, has to be taken very, very seriously. Um, because there hasn't really been a review of extremism now for a number of years. There are new threats, and uh, it is important, therefore, that um, we all come together to look at the question of extremism and what action is now needed. Uh, what I would say is that this will only work if it is truly cross-party um, and not divisive, and that's the spirit in which I want to enter uh, this discussion in relation to extremism. 
And Tom Wilson, what's been extraordinary about the intimidation towards the political class since October the 7th is that the hard left have also been going for the Labour Party. We've seen Angela Rayner harass Sir Keir Storm himself, chase off a train in Scotland, Rachel Reeves, Annalise Dodds. You know, there have been barracks outside of Labour Party MPs in London from the hard left. So it's not just a simple case of left wing and right wing. Everybody seems to be getting caught in the crossfire. Well, I think that the far left hoped that it was going to have control of the Labour Party and there's been a significant push to wrestle the extreme far left elements, particularly around the issue of anti-Semitism, out of Labour. And so clearly they're targeting the party once again. I think what I would pick up on, on what was said there by the leader of the opposition about whether there'd been anyone looking into extremism recently, well, we did have William Shawcross's review yes. into Prevent. And although that was about counter-terrorism, he found the government money was going to extremist groups and he looked at the extremist threat as well as part of that. Money that was supposed to help counter-extremism was actually going to people who were extremists, and the police were found to be consulting with extremists as well, which underlies the importance of having a better understanding within government of how you define who is an extremist and who isn't. And in terms of those problematic groups, which part of the political spectrum were they from? that was being engaged with. Well, that's yes. very interesting. They were exclusively, to my knowledge, Islamist. And what's really interesting is that on the question of engagement and funding, although we are hearing about the far right, to my knowledge, the government and the police, the public sector schools, they don't ever engage with the far right, rightly so. They don't fund the far right. The problem around engagement is usually starting with interfaith and attempts at community policing or counter-extremism when they end up engaging with the wrong people. Because whereas people on the far right and far right symbolism, swastikas are very recognisable to people, I think there's an ignorance and lack of understanding about the nature of the Islamist terrorist threat. And what's really fascinating about the groups that have been identified today from the Islamist end of the spectrum, Tom, is that the Muslim Engagement and Discipline, MEND, um, they've been called by the Henry Jackson Foundation Islamists masquerading as civil libertarians. Start off by trying to shine a light on Islamophobia and ended up actually hosting hate preachers, incitement to violence, sympathy for convicted terrorists. CAGE started out as a sympathy group for prisoners in Guantanamo Bay and ended up hosting Al-Qaeda recruiters at conferences in Britain. So this issue of um, Islamophobia that you pick up on is one that was also in the Shawcross review of Prevent because he clearly took a very strong stand against anti-Muslim hatred, but he warned that the fear of people being labelled Islamophobic by campaign groups meant that they were nervous around looking at the issue of Islamist extremism. And I think that raises a question about whether some of the mistakes that have been made in, in schemes like Prevent and in the public sector is because people are nervous about um, making a mistake. We know that the security guard in the Manchester Arena case was nervous about approaching yes. the bomber because he saw him praying with a large bag and he was concerned about how that might look. So this is something that a concern has been raised about, about whether it's creating a certain timidity about dealing with this issue. And Tom, do you hope that today's intervention by Michael Gove and the body of work we're about to see coming forward will we'll end this fear of, of, of grasping the nettle and just calling these organisations out for what they are. They're activists masquerading as good guys in many senses, but we've already heard that several of them might contest this in the course and deny the fact they're extremists. This could drag on and on. Well, what the government has provided, as well as a definition, is a set of clear behaviours that demonstrates what people actually do that crosses that threshold into extremism. So it's not just a theoretical or philosophical argument about how to define a word. This is going to provide, hopefully, people in government, people um, in schools, in police, in local councils who have to make decisions about who they engage with and who they fund, a clear set of criteria by how they can decide whether or not people shouldn't be getting public money. Because I don't think the taxpayer expects to see money that goes towards countering extremism going to extremists. Mm. Precisely. Mm. Um, that, that is a huge, huge point. You know, we, we are a very divided, very nervous society at the moment, post-October 7th. The very fact that public money might be going into the coffers of those who are actually trying to divide us, Tom, is grotesque. And the government for a long time has said it's going to make sure that that doesn't happen any longer. I think also the question about who is consulted with and who advises the government and the police is key. We saw when there were calls for jihad at one of these rallies following October the 7th that the police were sort of ambiguous, really, about whether this was a problem, whether they were going to crack down on this in any way. Um, and that goes to show how the influence sometimes of people who are themselves extremists 
can make the public sector confused and nervous about this issue. Just one question, Tom. Do you worry that a future government could use this new definition to try and crack down on critical voices who aren't, who aren't really extremists? I mean, that, that's a concern from um, some campaigners today. So the nature of what's been proposed, as I understand it, would only stop funding and engagement. This doesn't criminalise yeah. anyone. It shouldn't infringe on free speech. Uh, my concern would be that it's extremists who actually shut down free speech. And if the government takes a purely libertarian perspective on this, then we essentially absent ourselves from intervening in this really quite serious threat. Absolutely excellent guest, Tom Wilson, Director of Policy at the Counter Extremism Group. Fantastic. Thanks for coming in. Chris Overcourse, always superb. Now, we'll have lots more on that story later this hour, and I'll be joined by a Muslim journalist who's a member of the anti-racist organisation Don't Divide Us. That will be fascinating. And there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. You've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Now it's time for our spring Great British Giveaway and your chance to win gadgets, a shopping spree and a £12,345, one, two, three, four, five, tax-free spring cash boost. You've got to be in it to win it and here's how you could be our next big winner. Want to be a winner? You've won £18,000. I'm slipping it. I don't know what to say. Enter our massive spring giveaway with three big seasonal prizes to be won. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Now, fill your boots. Now, we've got a very worrying story for any of you whose loved ones are in hospital because dozens of young Brits are boasting about helping relatives pass nursing degrees and other healthcare qualifications. Are their qualifications bogus? We'll look into that after this. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Tubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, I of course, them. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they commit a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. For the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use if you it. Commit, there's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, that's an impossible solution. They've created something that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Earlier on Breakfast. Do you, do you think most people uh, watching this morning really care about funding for the arts. It means a lot in different parts of the country. It's too expensive to separate and get divorced, especially if you've got children. Yeah, it's probably a lot easier just to stay in that unhappy marriage and, and play yeah. away, yeah. TV News, uh, the home of free speech, um, exemplifies uh, uh, an approach towards that. You invite on people uh, to your shows who you may and your viewers may violently disagree with, but you think it's important to hear every side of the argument. From six, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. It's approaching 4.25. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later in the show, I'll tell you why there's no sign of the huge rift between William and Harry coming to an end any time soon. But first, to a very worrying story for any of you whose loved ones are in hospital. And that's because dozens of young Brits are boasting about helping relatives pass nursing degrees and other healthcare qualifications. Well, I'm now joined in our Westminster studio by GB News reporter Charlie Peters, who's got a superb exclusive on this. Charlie, always a pleasure to have you in the studio. It's bad enough at your time of need when your family members are in hospital, but the revelation that those treating them might have bogus qualification that chills you to the bone. And that's only the dozens that have been foolish enough to admit it online that they have been supporting their parents in getting that qualification. What we saw this week earlier, it didn't take much digging. People were posting on social media and boasting about the fact that they'd been doing coursework, essays and supporting multiple family members in their processes for getting degrees or qualifications, particularly surrounding nursing and other healthcare yeah. qualifications. Some said that they've been paid by other relatives in the family, not just their mother or their father, but, but aunties. We saw one person who I replied to who swiftly deleted their entire social media presence say that they'd even been paid by up to five family members to do this sort of work. They said their names should be on that certificate. And as that discussion went on, it also moved on to other social media platforms. We also saw a discussion on TikTok. And just to give our viewers and our listeners a flavour of what that is, we've got a clip we can play now. I saw a TikTok of the man in question doing his mum's uni work. You guys are out here doing, and you guys, because I read through the comments, you guys are out here doing your parents' work. Someone said, yeah, I was a mental health nurse by 16. You must really just think we're just some sort of robot. When they heard us, they thought, yep, no, nah, I've just got help for life. I get favours. Your parents have you doing degrees for them. A mental health nurse at 16. It's quite an extraordinary admission. And so when I shared some of this information with doctors working in the NHS now, they had some pretty stern words to say. One said that this could be jeopardising lives in the system. They were stunned to see the open boasting and admission of the process. They also said... What kind of processes could these people be faking? How are they having their qualifications supported by their children? They also asked, you know, could it be a sepsis process? Could they be focusing more on the application of drugs by intravenous means? They didn't know what on earth was going on. They didn't know how to make sense of it. One doctor also told me that there are some confusing scenarios they'd witnessed while working on wards in London, but by virtue of seeing this widespread conversation online about kids supporting their parents' nursing degrees, they said suddenly 
those errors and those strange scenarios started to make more sense. When I raised this with the Nursing and Midwifery Council, they said they, did, they weren't formally aware of any process like the one that we'd raised. But with so many complaints, it seems almost certain that this is a widespread issue. So to be absolutely clear, this is people within Britain mm. doing qualifications within Britain for relatives who would have no qualifications or no chance of passing the, those qualifications. Is it also happening in countries abroad, mm. people faking it to get in? Because I saw an alarming thread from a Ghanaian expert I contacted who said this is actually happening within Ghana and other African nations itself. So the qualifications there being sat by other people, getting visas to come into Britain from abroad without even having a qualification at all. Well, the health and social care visa has come under pretty significant criticism in the last year with that record net migration figure that we saw last year. The Department of Health and Social Care reportedly only expected a handful of people to come in on that scheme, and the numbers really exploded beyond their predictions. There has also been some analysis now which has led to the government reducing the ability of dependents arriving on that scheme to arrive in Britain. That's expected to reduce it. But at the same time, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, they're currently investigating some 700 nurses already in the system on allegations that they fraudulently acquired their qualifications in Nigeria and they had proxies sitting and taking that test. A former head of that college, told of the, the Royal uh, College of Nurses, did say that this could also be putting lives at risk and you couldn't have nurses under investigation working on hospital wards. So clearly a big discussion at the moment more, more widely about the issue of qualifications, how they're acquired, and also, crucially, how they are linked to immigration. And, Charlie, we also hear about um, care visas being given out to people from abroad coming to care homes that don't exist, mm. or, or, or care homes giving out many thousands of visas when they cleared out the capacity to employ anywhere near that number. And this has generated, as we, as we reported last week on the GB News website, quite an extraordinary explosion in the number of people advertising overseas, particularly in Bangladesh and in yeah. northern India, as we found, advertising that as a route into Britain easy, they say, and your entire family can come with you. Superb stuff. A cracking exclusive, Charlie Peters. Great stuff. Keep digging. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock, and I'll discuss the controversial decision that saw the Labour MP, who used the phrase between the river and the sea at a pro-Palestine rally, well, he's had the whip restored. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Martin. It's 4.30. I'm Sophia Wenslet in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. Michael Gove has named some of the groups to be investigated under a new definition of extremism, which she says will mean the government can express more clearly than ever who poses a risk to Britain. The groups include the Muslim Association of Britain, CAGE and MEND, which are alleged to have Islamist views, and the British National Movement and Patriotic Alternative, which are described as neo-Nazi. Today's new extremism definition will be used to assess which groups should be blocked from public funding. But the community secretary insists it's not about silencing those with private and peaceful beliefs. Scotland's former health secretary has been found to have breached the code of conduct after an investigation into the £11,000 bill on a parliamentary iPad. Michael Matheson quit his role in the wake of the scandal over his state of roaming charges, which he racked up while holidaying in Morocco over Christmas in 2022. He later admitted that his teenage sons used the device as a hotspot to watch football. A full report into his spending is expected to be released in the coming months. MPs are getting a pay rise with an inflation-busting 5.5% boost, pushing salaries to around £91,000. It means pay will increase by more than £4,700 next year, or almost £400 extra each month. The Westminster watchdog says it's in line with an award for senior civil servants, but it's above inflation, which is just 4%. And the Prince of Wales has expressed concerns about the amount of time children spend on phones as he visited a youth club in London today. The prince asked some of the children how long they spend on their phones, with one girl saying she spends up to 15 hours a day. The future king said grown-ups were also guilty of excessive screen time and said we've all got to get better at managing it. 
And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Sophia. Now, I'm about to have more on our top story, and that, of course, is the government's new definition of extremism. And I'll be joined by a Muslim journalist who's a member of the anti-racist organisation Don't Divide Us. You will not want to miss that. I'm Martin Dorbley on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9pm. Uh, Kinsey, great to have you back on the show. Now, listen, you, uh, we're, not, well, we're not slated to talk about the Prince Harry story, but um, I've kind of surprised a few people by suggesting that I think he should have armed royal protection when he's in Britain. What do you think? Well, they aren't my tax dollars that are paying for Prince Harry's protection, but I agree with you. I think that he should feel safe and he should feel safe to bring his family back to see his father, if that's the case. Well, his stepmother, uh, Kinsey, Queen Camilla, gets a well-deserved break. Tell me more. That's right. Queen Camilla has no engagements on her agenda this week, with the Times reporting that she will spend a few days of downtime with the king. Camilla has been working overtime to support the monarchy just last Last month, she repeatedly drove over six hours to a royal engagement after her flight was grounded because she reportedly did not want to let down her husband. She will resume engagements on March 11th, representing the king and leading the royal family for the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. A source told The Times, although she was not expecting to find herself in the position of leading the family, the queen is absolutely prepared to do whatever needs to be done for the institution. And can I just say, speaking of Harry, I think the fact that Queen Camilla is seen as leading the family is significant proof that Prince Harry would not return to mm. temporarily support the family because Camilla's elevated position is likely not something sitting well with him right now. He loved Queen Elizabeth II. He likely resents the idea of Queen Camilla. And we know um, that that's a position he felt like his mother should be in. Most definitely. He was very nasty about Queen Camilla in his book Spare. He <laughs> He was. So I imagine that the idea of her leading the family is something he has a hard time digesting. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.37. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. They sent so many emails about today's big announcement on extremism and also the criticism that the Princess of Wales has been getting recently. I'll read the best of them out a little later in this hour. Get them in if you haven't yet. GBviews at GBnews.com. Now, let's get more on our top story today, and that's the government's long-awaited clampdown on extremism. Now, Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, that will be investigated over extremism fears. 
Well, join us now to discuss this is a spokesperson for Don't Divide Us, Kajida Khan. Welcome to the show, Kajida. Always a pleasure. What do you make of um, Michael Gove's announcement today? He singled out three um, groups from the Muslim end of the spectrum, as it were, and two from the far right. But one of the far right groups hasn't existed since the 1960s. What was your take on it? Thank you so much for having me. Um, I would like to expand this argument uh, just to put it into a context. Um, just recently, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, he uh, announced the budget and in the very beginning, he's talked about uh, the, a foreign conflict and then he talked about tackling extremism and then he uh, talked about healing divisions and then he jumped onto uh, the memorial for, for Muslims. You know, the war memorial for Muslims. So they, he talked about all these things in a row and he conflated so many issues. Right now we are facing a threat that is an Islamist threat. But he, instead of just dealing right away with this threat, he started, you know, like playing around the word, the semantics. And the real threat and the, the discussion that should be focused on this one thing was just nowhere to be seen or to be uh, taken place uh, in social and political discourse. And now come to this announcement about the definition of extremism. Uh, the previous definition of extremism, extremism was given under the prevent uh, strategy in 2011. And that was uh, according to that, that time and frame, it was quite comprehensive definition, but it didn't work out because people, they were not uh, very much convinced uh, about th that definition of extremism. And the same thing is happening at the moment. The people, they, there is a backlash, you know, against this uh, definition of extremism uh, because it, it's never worked out in the past and it's not going to work now because we don't have a problem uh, of defining extremism at the moment. We have extremism, but we have a problem with dealing with extremism. I mean, there are problems uh, with the law enforcers who have been unable, incompetent in dealing with this threat on the street of London. And this is the problem that should uh, we should be talking about. We, mm. we know what is extremism. There are existing laws uh, regarding hate speech, regarding tackling extremism. So we, we don't need further definition of it. And uh, as you uh, said about those three groups, Muslim uh, organizations that has be, that have been singled out uh, in in Michael Gove's speech, I would say that these groups have been, you know, reported in mainstream media outlets about their activities, about their associations. Yet uh, there was no action uh, that could be. Uh, taken against yeah. them and try to prevent that those activities or associations. I mean, uh, this is the problem where the laws are not being enforced or implemented. This is not the okay, problem can I, can about can I, can what I, can is... I interject? Can I, can I please interject to that point, um, Khadija? Because it strikes me that um, missing from this debate so often are Muslim voices such as your own to put a degree of balance on this conversation because, of course, all Muslims are not the same and do not share the same values. And, in fact, one of the groups identified today, Muslim Engagement and Discipline Mend, specifically in their Islamophobia Awareness Month in 2017, as well as supporting corporal punishment against Jews, homosexuals, they also singled out non-believers, Muslims, as they called them, minority Muslim sects, clearly... Um, taking umbrage with people within the Muslim community who don't agree with their extremist views. And in that sense, it needs people such as yourself to call them out. The problem is that there have been moderate voices, dissenting voices within the Muslim communities, but they were silenced, they were muzzled, they were brushed aside. And people like these organizations who, who run these organizations, we see these people being uh, presented uh, on, on um, media outlets as, as the representatives of, of Muslim communities. I mean, uh, Anjan Chaudhary was represented uh, 
presented as, as, as a spokesperson for Muslim communities. Then Mohammed Hijab was uh, presented as a spokesperson for Muslim communities. Now we, sh we see Shaquille Afsar, who led, uh, you know, intimidating mobs outside the schools and cinemas, and who hackled an, a British MP. I mean, he is being... Uh, featured in Sky News today, I just saw that, and it was so shocking for me, as he was uh, presented as, as a spokesperson for Muslim communities. I mean, this is the governments, the successor governments who have been given, uh, giving these people so much importance and treating them as the so-called, uh, you know, community leaders and then the media outlets who give these people, you know, the oxygen of publicity. And then uh, somehow these people, they, they manage to get a position where they uh, bully the whole communities into compliance, really. And people, they just don't want to get into trouble for that reason. Yeah. Because, can, I mean, just imagine can, can I, that... Can I, can I also interject again? Because obviously that... That individual, you know, he's not here to defend himself. Let's put that to one side. But can, can I, can I um, ask you a, a question about the idea that a lot of the time, the, the politicians, the they don't seem to understand the nature, and by trying to do the right thing, by trying to give Muslim communities a voice, we're seeing um, they are endorsing these organisations and often funding them. We had a counter-terrorism expert on earlier, Tom Wilson, who said often money is changing hands because they don't, they're not aware of the fact they think that these groups are doing good. But actually, in actual fact, in terms of certainly the ones that are named today, turn out to be opportunists who are actually dividing us. That is the problem, actually. I mean, there are fringes, extreme fringes within the Muslim communities. These fringes have to be singled out and dealt with. But the problem is that with, be, instead of dealing with these fringes head on, the government and the MPs and, and the media, they are just like tiptoeing around these issues. I mean, they are bringing in, uh, in, into discussion uh, things like such as uh, um, building war memorial and then, you know, healing divisions. I mean, there is a threat. There are people who are uh, promoting intolerant views and beliefs, and they are basing the foundation of those views uh, on, on religion, on religious teachings. You need to tackle these issues head on. And when they say that they cannot understand the water advice is coming from from uh, the Muslim communities. I mean, I don't buy this uh, into this argument because uh, there are many Muslim, British Muslims, who are living a peaceful life, who love Britain, who who espouse democratic secular values, uh, free freedom of speech that that we all espouse and we we take pride in. But then uh, those people, where do you see those people? I mean. If, if they want to talk to some someone from Muslim community, they would go for the radical, for the rigid interpretation of, of, okay. of, of the religion. And those people who espouse those rigid and intolerant views and into, intolerant you know, interpretation of religion, of course, they would choose them to represent uh, the Muslim communities. And they, these people, these so-called community leaders, they have become a face of Muslim community and that, that present them in such bad light for the rest of the society. I mean, people, okay. people well, like... Th th thank you very much for speaking out and having the bravery to be one of those moderate Muslim voices calling out this bad behaviour. An excellent interview. Thank you so much for joining us. And our spokesperson from don't divide us, Khadija Khan. Thank you very, very much indeed. What a superb, balanced interview that was. Love it. Now, Labour has restored the whip to the MP who used the phrase between the river and the sea at a pro-Palestine rally. Are they saying that that comment is now allowed and it's not anti-Semitic? We'll have more on that in a moment. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More heavy downpours to come tomorrow. It won't rain all day. There will be some brighter spells and another pretty mild day in the south. But, uh, you know, it's not going to be completely dry when low pressure is dominating. This one's sitting right over as these weather fronts have been providing persistent rain through the day. It stays very soggy overnight across central and southern Scotland. Showers elsewhere and some decent drier spells developing over the Midlands and eastern England before more heavy 
heavy showers coming to Wales and southwest England through the early hours. Could be the odd rumble of thunder mixed in with that and the winds gusting up as well. A very mild night for most, but um, a bit chilly in northern Scotland where a touch of frost is just about possible. A, a cold start then with the rain over a good part of Scotland, although not as heavy as today. It stays pretty dull and damp through south east Scotland for most of the day. Elsewhere, it'll be a case of bright spells and some showers, some heavy showers, particularly early on and then later on through the afternoon across eastern England. Some brightness, though, for Northern Ireland, west coast of Scotland, on the chilly side here, whereas in the south, again, into the teens, a bit of brightness in eastern England, could see highs of 15 or 16. Temperature dropping there on Friday night. So Saturday starts with a frost for many. I suspect much of eastern England, northern England, Scotland will stay dry on Saturday. Further west, the cloud thickening all the while with outbreaks of rain trickling in. Again, reasonably mild in the south, although don't forget, it will be a bit of a chilly start. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.50. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now to Labour's controversial decision to restore the whip to the MP who used the phrase between the river and the sea in a speech at a pro-Palestine rally. Andy MacDonald, who's the MP for Middlesbrough, lost the whip last October. But a Labour spokesman has said their investigation concluded that he had not engaged in conduct that was against the party's rulebook. Well, there we go. So to react to this, we're joined by former Labour MP Stephen Pound. Stephen, always a pleasure to have you on the show. This would come as quite a shock to a lot of people who saw, for example, that phrase projected onto Big Ben, an anti-Semitic phrase that sort of um, shamed our nation. Now it's OK for a Labour MP to say it's back in the fold. What's your take on this? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Martin. You know, let's, let's follow the excellent example of your previous interviewee and try to get a bit of balance in on this one. First of all, um, and he, he, wasn't, he didn't lose the whip. It was what they call an administrative suspension. He was suspended while they investigated. He used that expression in October last year. He also said in that very same speech, in that very same sentence, he called, there must be peace for the Palestinians and the Israelis to live together in peace. And he was actually attacked at that time for even contemplating the idea of a twin-state solution. Now, anyone who uses that expression since October last year, quite rightly, would be hauled over the coals and accused of fanning the flames. And he used that expression back in the t in October when hardly anybody outside, you know, a few people might be, maybe yourself and a few people are particularly up to speed on this, even knew that expression. What the other thing, a key thing is, unlike Diane Abbott, who you'll doubtless be mentioning, um, who's been a sort of you know, dumping a bucket over the Labour Party in today's Guardian. And he's been quietly getting on, working with this awful, the horror of the, the, the Tees Valley Freeport nonsense up there in his constituency. So he's apologised. He said he's deeply sorry. He said it at the time, but he also said Israelis and Palestinians have to live in peace. So he's a decent bloke, and I think it's quite right that he's actually had the suspension lifted. 
OK, Stephen, I'm glad you mentioned Diane Abbott because reports just come in that Angela Rayner, of course, as deputy leader of the Labour Party, is saying she would like to see Diane Abbott back as a Labour MP. And, of course, this is following on from the, the, the allegations that the Tory donor made about Miss Abbott. Let's remind ourselves of why Diane Abbott lost the Labour Party whip. She said that Jews, Irish and travellers are not subject to racism all their lives. She was thrown out of the party for racism and now Angela Rayner appears to want her back in the party because, because Diane Abbott experienced racism of their own. It seems that the Labour Party are quite happy to forgive racism when it's one of their own, but if it's somebody else, they're calling for their heads. No, no, hang, hang on a second. Um, Diana said a bit more than that. She actually referred to the, the situation with, uh, which Jews and Irish travellers were accepted as people having red hair. She actually made an association of people suffering from red hair. It may be difficult for you to believe, but once upon a time I had red hair, and I'd never remotely compare, you know, the sort of the hassle I used to get, you know, all the, all the nonsense you used to get for being called a ginger, to the, the horrors of the, the Jews and, and so many other people have suffered. So that's, it's, I think that's a different issue. As for... Um, Angela Rayner's comment, and Harriet Harman said the same thing. You know, you know, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't in the poor old Labour Party. They used to say that we were actually all on message and we were driven by these pages and we never departed from the script and we always said the same thing. Nowadays, a few of us express an individual opinion and suddenly, you know, we, we were getting buckets of audio tipped over us. So well, well, I think... Well, how, how yeah, a lot yeah. of people, Stephen, um, uh, uh, would, would, would say with some justification that Diane Abbott's comments were blatantly racist. And now it appears yeah. that she's, f she's forgiven. She's served some time uh, as an independent, same as Mr MacDonald. Uh, they got told off, slap on the wrist, and now, come on, you're welcome back into the fold. Don't you think that sends out a concerning message? No, no, it's, it's totally different. Uh, Andy, Andy MacDonald has apologised from day one. He's actually got on with his job being a damn good MP up in Middlesbrough. He hasn't written articles like Diane Abbott has in today's Guardian, which has made it very difficult for those of us who would like to have more people in the Labour Party. I'd rather have people in than out of the Labour Party. It's made it very, very difficult. It's also, you can't compare apples and oranges. What Andy said at the time he said it okay. was very much off the cuff at a meeting. Diane Abbott's letter she wrote to one of the Sunday newspapers, I think it was the Observer newspaper, was calculated... Right, I'm afraid, Stephen, and we're going we're gonna to have to leave it there again. I'm so sorry. We've simply okay. run out of time, but thank you very much for joining us on the show. Now, we'll have much more on Michael Gove's speech earlier about those extremist groups and the definition. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. First, your weather with Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More heavy downpours to come tomorrow. It won't rain all day. There will be some brighter spells and another pretty mild day in the south. But, uh, you know, it's not going to be completely dry when low pressure is dominating. This one's sitting right over as these weather fronts have been providing persistent rain through the day. It stays very soggy overnight across central and southern Scotland. Showers elsewhere and some decent drier spells developing over the Midlands and eastern England before more heavy showers come into Wales and southwest England through the early hours. Could be the odd rumble of thunder mixed in with that and the winds gusting up as well. A very mild night for most, but um, a bit chilly in northern Scotland where a touch of frost is just about possible. A, a cold start then with the rain over a good part of Scotland, although not as heavy as today. It stays pretty dull and damp through South East Scotland for most of the day. Elsewhere, it'll be a case of bright spells and some showers, some heavy showers, particularly early on and then later on through the afternoon across eastern England. Some brightness, though, for Northern Ireland, west coast of Scotland, on the chilly side here, whereas in the south, again, into the teens, a bit of brightness in eastern England, could see highs of 15 or 16. Temperature dropping there on Friday night. So Saturday starts with a frost for many. I suspect much of eastern England, northern England, Scotland will stay dry on Saturday. Further west, the cloud thickening all the while with outbreaks of rain trickling in. Again, reasonably mild in the south, although don't forget, it will be a bit of a chilly start. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
We've got cash, treats and a spring shopping spree to be won in a great British giveaway. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 5 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. In today's show, Government Minister Michael Gove has announced their long-awaited crackdown on extremism. And he's named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, which he said could be investigated. Next, William and Harry will appear at the same event tonight, but there's no sign of the royal rift coming to an end anytime soon. And Nigel Farage's next political move is keeping everyone on their toes, with some saying a comeback could be a fatal blow for the floundering Conservative Party. Will our very own GB News presenter mock the end for the Tories? And there's the 101-year-old woman who's leading the fight to get what's been branded the most potholed road in England fixed. She's an absolute trooper. We'll have the full details on that and all of those other cracking stories coming up in your next hour. Thanks to the show and thanks for joining us. We've had a cracking show so far. So much to go at. Michael Gove's announcement today about clamping down on extremism. Five groups named, three of them Muslim groups with a shady past. Two on the right wing. We looked into one of them. Hasn't even existed since the 1960s. And the other one, the biggest crime we could unearth, was somebody was arrested for and jailed for racist stickers. We'll be diving into the true threats. We had a police and 
National Crime Commission on earlier who said the threat is far over on the left and the Islamist side of things and a counter-terror expert shedding some further light on it. We're having a full balanced conversation here. Let me know what you think about this topic that's dividing the nation. GB Views at GBNews.com. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia Wenzer. Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past five. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story this hour. Michael Gove has named some of the groups to be investigated under a new definition of extremism, which she says will mean the government can express more clearly than ever who poses a risk to Britain. The groups include some alleged to have Islamist views, as well as others which are described as neo-Nazi. Today's new extremism definition will be used to assess which groups should be blocked from public funding. But Michael Gove insists it's not about silencing those with private and peaceful beliefs. We have to be clear-eyed about the threat we face, precise about where that threat comes from, and rigorous in defending our democracy. That means upholding freedom of expression, religion and belief when they are threatened, facing down harassment and hate, supporting the communities facing the greatest challenge from extremist activity, and ensuring this House and this country are safe, free and united. Some Conservative backbenchers have suggested the new definition lands in no man's land, neither strong enough to tackle true extremists nor protect opposing views. Labour leader Sakir Starmer says there are new threats which must be tackled together. I think the debate about extremism uh, has to be taken very, very seriously um, because there hasn't really been a review of extremism now for a number of years. There are new threats and uh, it is important, therefore, that um, we all come together to look at the question of extremism and what action is now needed. Uh, what I would say is that this will only work if it is truly cross-party um, and not divisive. And that's the spirit in which I want to enter uh, this discussion in relation to extremism. Sakir Starmer speaking there. Now MPs are getting a pay rise with an inflation busting 5.5% boost, pushing salaries to around £91,000. It means pay will increase by more than £4,700 next year, or almost £400 extra each month. The Westminster watchdog says it's in line with an award for senior civil servants, but it's above inflation, which is just 4%. Russia has been accused of disrupting the GPS signal on the Defence Secretary's plane en route to Poland. The incident occurred as the RAF jet flew close to the edge of Kaliningrad. GPS navigation and internet access was lost for around 30 minutes during the flight, but the pilots have confirmed the aircraft was never at risk. The incident happened as Grant Shapps visited British troops participating in NATO exercises in Poland. A review into air traffic control issues that caused widespread chaos during last August bank holiday weekend has found some engineers were working from home. Nearly 750,000 passengers were disrupted when flights were grounded at UK airports on the 28th of August. It was after National Air Traffic Services suffered a technical glitch. An interim report found a lack of rehearsal for an incident of its nature and scale and a significant lack of pre-planning. The chief of Deliveroo says the effects of high inflation on food are starting to recede after rising costs or customers paying more money for fewer orders. Will Shu says costs of living increases saw many consumers tightening their budget and forgoing takeaway dinners. He said food inflation was outpacing wages by about two to one, putting a squeeze on spending power. Economists expect inflation to fall over the coming months, helped in part by lower energy costs. And Scotland's former health secretary has been found to have breached the code of conduct after an investigation into the £11,000 bill he racked up on a parliamentary iPad. Michael Matheson quit his role in the wake of the scandal over his data roaming charges, which he racked up while on holiday in Morocco over Christmas 2022. He later admitted that his teenage sons used a parliamentary device as a hotspot to watch football. A full report into his spending is expected to be released in the coming months. And Prince William has expressed concerns about the amount of time children spend on phones as he visited a youth club today. He was visiting a new £12 million centre called West, which stands for When Everyone Sticks Together. 
The prince asks some of the children how long they spend on their phones, with one girl saying she spends up to 15 hours a day. The future king said grown-ups were also guilty of excessive screen time and said we've all got to be better at managing it. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Martin. Thank you, Sophia. Now we start with the government's long awaited clamp down on extremism. And Michael Gove has named five groups, including three Muslim organisations, that will be investigated over extremism fears. And I'm joined in the studio by our political editor, Chris Verhope. Chris, um, an astonishing day. Finally, Michael Gove vowing to clamp down on extremism, named three Muslim groups, two, by his definition, from the far right. And um, will it have proper teeth? Will we actually clamp down? Or is it yet, yet more lip service? This is an attempt, I think, to squeeze the money going into these different these um, extremist uh, groups, as the government would describe them. 2011, they just they worked out what they thought extremism was um, with this prevent strategy, which is run by the communities part of the government, the communities department, not the Home Office. It's kind of the soft way they try to stop people becoming um, uh, radicalised. Um, but they realised that it's not going that well. Some of the groups named in Parliament today, five groups, uh, two on the far right, three on the on the on the m m Muslim side the argument. Um, some have received charitable money and that mm. is frustrating I think for ministers. I think when they can be caught, when you can prescribe some of them as extremist groups, that only means the trustees of these charities can't give them money and that's how you start squeezing and put pressure on them to try and bring, bring in their rein in their, their activities. It's interesting looking at the group's name, the Muslim Engagement and Discipline MEND. The Henry Jackson Foundation said that that is Islamists masquerading as civil libertarians in 2017. Islamist Phobia Awareness Week. They hosted hate preachers, incitement to violence. They called for corporal punishment against Jewish people, homosexuals and minority Muslims. Cage. Um, they were sympathetic with those in Guantanamo Bay, but then invited a release Al-Qaeda terrorist to speak well, at a conference in Britain and the Muslim Association of Britain today. Michael Gove himself said that the Palestinian version of that is Hamas. He said everything in Parliament, of course, but um, he was a a able to, um, in terms of, of being protected by privilege. Um, and many of those things happened many years ago, by the way. And it's, some might say, why has the government taken so long to look at this definition and try and squeeze the funding on uh, on groups um, which 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 are saying these kinds of things? Of course, um, of the five mentioned, they'll be looked at by the government, by the Home Secretary James Cleverly and Michael Gove, the Community Secretary. They'll weigh up whether they should be dubbed extremists. More will be added to that list, and when that list emerges in two or three weeks' time, there'll be a big row. Some of the groups will go to the High Court. The only way they can appeal it is by getting a judicial review um, of the decision made, made by the ministers. So, we, we, so I think we're at the start of what will be a big row. And also, there are concerns denied, denied by Mr Gove today on GB News that some groups may be, may be hooked in by this extremism definition, and they shouldn't be, such as anti-abortion groups, um, uh, faith groups, um, so Christian groups, this kind of thing. They, they're concerned they can be hooked in sitting on the right of the, of the Tory party. Mm. Now, do we think that um, we've had a, a police and crime commissioner on the show earlier on, we've had a counter-terrorism expert in an attempt to quantify the tangible, the actual threat, and do we think that we've left out some groups here? I mean, the, the police and crime commission said a lot of the violence is from the far left, but they weren't even mentioned today. They weren't today. They might be in the future. So I think this is the beginning. I think there are concerns that how far does these, will this definition, definition be stretched? And it could be stretched too far by future governments. I mean, anyone who believes that the state should be controlled or in, in some way, or at least it kept watch on by Parliament, might be alarmed by this. Certainly the Free Speech Union is. It may be used by future governments to crack down on free speech, and that's a worry. And do we think this will have any teeth? I mean, what will actually happen? Um, because we've already heard that some of these organisations may well contest this and court Well, that, the only teeth it will have is really in the civil courts. It's not a criminal thing. It's, it's trying, to, trying to for the government to say these groups are, we think, are extremists, and that will stop central government giving them money, and the government's hoping that will cascade down to the, maybe to NGOs and the voluntary sector to say, think twice before donating to them. 
Okay, super. Thanks for joining us, Chris Hope. Loads to talk about there. And joining us now is the director at the International Organization to Preserve Human Rights, Matty Heaven. What a name, Matty. Thanks for joining us. So, a lot of tough talk today in Parliament. How confident are you that this will actually translate into action to stamping out these groups? Uh Good afternoon, Martin, and thank you for having me. And hello to all the viewers in GB News. Uh, I really welcome this new definition. It was time we needed it. It's been a long time. Uh, I can tell you, as a director of International Organization to Preserve Human, Human Rights, we've been 15 years trying to highlight the rise of extremism, especially focusing on Islamist extremism, where they hijacked the religion of Islam and continue to recruit using the religion of Islam uh, and radicalize people. And this has grown significantly, and we have witnessed it more and more in the last 12 months. So I think it is so critical for us to have that definition. Um, and I, I believe that uh, those people who say this will divide us, it would not. It, it would actually unite the right people together. Because currently, what we're seeing is the rise of Islamist extremism growing. As a result, what they will do, they feed off the right, far right extremism. And it's not helping the situation. But what we need to understand and distinguish, and what we've been trying to say for the last 15 years, is that these people who use the name of religion, they use mosques, they use charity organizations, they are hiding on the name of Islam. And that's the problem has been. And that's the way they can recruit people. And they're radicalizing our youth. That is a real serious problem. And, you know, funding, stop funding them is one step. But I will go one step further and say those people, because they could get funding from outside of UK too. And there's times we know that Iranian regime is one of those funders. I mean, my husband being... Uh, was on hunger strike because of this reason for, you know, back in 12, 12 months ago, Vahi Beshti. So um, I just think that it's important that we need to tackle it. We have a serious issue and this is not going to go away. It's become, it's growing and growing, it's dangerous and it's taking actually freedom of speech away because what I've noticed is that these is extremists they you again using the Islam and anyone who condemns their action, they constantly hide under the name of Islamophobia. And I believe that this will tackle even Islamophobia because it will distinguish with people who are practicing Islam, those people who are moderate, they want to get on with their life, they don't want to preach hate. Those people who are using the Islam to brainwash people and recruit people. And that is the distinction that is so important that for our society to understand and stop giving them a platform that as people are afraid to okay. speak out. Matty, um, can I interject and ask you a question? Do you think that a lot of these groups uh, initially um, were masquerading as being a helpful force? For example, Muslim engagement and disciplined men who were name-checked by Michael Gove today. The Henry Jackson Foundation said that they are Islamists masquerading as civil libertarians. And a lot of these groups are getting funding maybe from politicians who, who think they're doing the right thing, who think they're trying to address Islamophobia, but in actual fact, perhaps, opportunists are in there getting government money to press perhaps a more nefarious agenda. Very much so. That's what's been happening. The opportunists know that, and that's their platform. They've been growing, using politicians or using, again, I think it's a wrong way to say, uh, diversity because they're actually dividing people by why are we never hear about this organization talking about bringing people together bringing different faiths together it's about anti-semitism it's about hate speech i mean what i believe that in a tolerant society we cannot tolerate intolerance if we in tolerate intolerance that's appeasing to them and we need to take a very very firm stand and stand strong against these rises of extremism that that now we're witnessing in in our society 
OK, thank you very much for joining us, Matty Heaven, who is the director of the International Organisation to Preserve Human Rights. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Fascinating stuff. Now, you get lots more on that story on our website. And thanks to you, GBNews.com is the fastest growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all of the brilliant analysis that you've come to expect from GB News. Now, spring is in the air, and so is your chance to win a God and Gadget package, a shopping spree, and an incredible £12,345, one, two, three, four, five, in tax free cash. And here's how you can make those prizes yours. We've got cash, treats and a spring shopping spree to be won in a great British giveaway. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Now, Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, has said she'd like to see Diane Abbott back as a party MP in the Labour Party. Seriously? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Free Speech Nation. Sunday nights from 7pm. I've got an idea. I think that all 30-year-olds should be given £10,000 from the banks of baby boomers. We've got a situation in this country now where millennials are the first generation in modern times expecting to be poorer than their parents. We, as 30-year-olds like me, are half as likely to own a house as people my age 30 years ago. In fact, the cost of a home in Britain compared to average incomes has as big a gap today as it did wait for it, in the 1860s. It is a Dickensian situation. Now, I'm sorry about the housing crisis for your generation. You're not, though, are you? No, because you're I profiting am. from it. I'm profiting from it. Don't of course be ridiculous. You are. The house prices now, right. compared to that period. If this is the case, have, Benjamin. Have incomes gone up that fast? To, to penalise and punish the elderly when they have worked yeah. all their lives to put into the system and say it's your fault, whingy whiny, we're going to yeah, be envious. Um, but, but, but no, Linda, go, we're no, being punished. No, well, by the politics, so be we're the change being punished because in the taxes, world. Taxes, be the change. I am actually, and I'm about to tell you about the change I want to see in the world. Are you good? As long as you're not whining about it. I'm going to stop worrying about it, but the re we are being taken advantage of at the moment to profit, to help the old. Mo most of taxpayers' money is spent in two departments, the NHS, so the health department, and the Department for Work and Pensions. Those departments disproportionately serve the older population. Now, I've got no issue with that, but let's not pretend, let's not pretend that it is not young working people that is paying for the public services for old people. So actually, we are having it hard, and I just look at the future, and we see a future of perpetually higher taxes to pay for this increasing ageing population, a shrinking labour force, and you're here saying so we've got nothing how to you worry vote. about. The young stop voting for mass immigration. Immigration parties, the young, I stop voting for Immigr parties Sorry, just to, that just to point out, build houses. Immigrants actually pay taxes, pensioners don't. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel.
Welcome back. It's 5.21. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, I hear from the 101-year-old woman who's campaigning for her local council to repair what's been called the most potholed road in Britain. What an absolute legend she is. Now, let's get more on the story I broke in the last hour, and it's deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, has said that she would like to see Diane Abbott back as a Labour Party MP. Former Shadow Home Secretary Ms Abbott has sat as an independence MP since last April, of course, and the Labour whip was withdrawn following a letter she sent to the Observer newspaper suggesting Jewish, Irish and traveller people are not subject to racism, quotes, all their lives. Well, our political correspondent Catherine Forster joins me in the studio and she heard Angela Rayner make those remarks earlier today. Catherine, it's an astonishing thing to, to say. Diane Abbott's been in the news this week. Of course, the Tory donor said allegedly racist things about her. Now it seems that that means that Diane Abbott should be allowed back into the party with a free pass. Like what she said has been scratched off the card because somebody was racist to her. Please try and help me make sense of this. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was at this lunch with, with Angela Rayner, uh, Deputy Labour Leader, earlier. Um, and yes, she did say she would like to see Diana Abbott readmitted to the party. Let's just uh, refresh our memories of the reason why she had the whip removed uh, last April. She wrote a comment piece in which she basically said that... Uh, Irish people, travellers, Jewish people didn't experience racism in the same way as, as black people because they didn't experience it all their lives. Now, obviously, when millions of Jews died in the Holocaust, when there were anti-Semitic attacks uh, still going on, uh, this was seen by many, Keir Starmer too, as being anti-Semitic. Uh, it caused outrage. She apologised, but she had the whip taken away. And what this conservative row over race and Frank Hester's comments has done is put the spotlight back onto Diane Abbott because, of course, Frank Hester reportedly said she should be shot. So nearly a year on, she's still been cast out of the Labour Party and there is an investigation ongoing. But really, how long does it take to decide what to do. Now, we pressed uh, Sir Keir Starmer's spokesman yesterday on this, and all he would say is, I can't comment, this is an ongoing, independent investigation. Um, nothing to see here, basically. But, of course, there is a general election coming. Uh, a decision will have to be made sooner or later on what to do. And a lot of people will suspect that they're deliberately dragging their heels because... If they readmit her, as Angela Rayner has said she'd like to see, a lot of people will say, aha, this was anti-Semitic. You've readmitted somebody who's made anti-Semitic comments. You haven't driven anti-Semitism from the party as you've claimed that you have. And on the other hand, if they say, no, we're not going to give you back the whip, you're out of Labour for good, what sort of message does that send? Because she was, of course, the first female black MP, female MP, to be elected to Parliament. Uh, you know, she's been a, a trailblazer in, in many ways. So I think both options, whichever way they go, are difficult. And there's this process going on. It's very opaque. But um, wh whatever the outcome, there's trouble for Labour. But a lot of people will be saying, you know, what, Ang what Angela Rayner is, is endorsing here is what Diane Abbott said, and it offended a huge amount of people. We're in a time where anti-Semitism is, is worse than we've ever seen it in the country. Is this politics all about timing? Is this really the right time to be, to be dangling a carrot to somebody like Diane Abbott? Yeah, but by the same token, um, you know, they can say, well, uh, uh, Diane Abbott apologised. She realised she'd messed up. She apologised. She deserves to be forgiven in exactly the same way that the Conservative Party is currently going. Frank Hester made offensive comments. They were wrong. They were racist. He's apologised. Let's move on. So, you know, it, it, it works both ways. But I uh, suspect, and I was talking earlier to, to somebody who's been through the experience that Diane Abbott mm. is going through now, um, it's all very opaque. It's, it's very unpleasant for the person concerned. Um, but, you know, Diana, but yesterday in, in, in PMQs, standing up 
again and again and again, trying to get the eye of the speaker, trying to get a question. Now, he said it was because he didn't have time and the way that yeah. it works didn't allow him to do that. Um, so Keir Starmer went and spoke to Diane Abbott at the end. Um, reportedly, we've heard this second hand, she said uh, that she'd like the whip back because, you know, they're, mm. they're making supportive noises to her. But at the moment, they, uh, that support does not extend to uh, letting her back in the Labour okay. Party. Another hoo-ha on the Labour Party. Catherine Forster, fabulous stuff. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, Prince William and Prince Harry will both appear at an event honouring their late mother, Princess Diana, tonight. But if you thought, if you're hoping, this could be the start of a thawing in relations between the two brothers, well, I'm afraid you're going to be very disappointed. And I'm joined now by the former BBC Royal Correspondent, the legend, that is Michael Cole. Michael, what on earth would Princess Diana think of this hoo-ha looking down upon the pair of them? You absolutely summed it up. That is the nub of the question. These are the Diana Awards. Diana loved her sons to the nth degree. I remember not very long before she was so tragically killed, I said to her, the boys were getting teenagers, and I said to her, you've really bred some height back into the royal family, because the royal family tended to be short. And she said, and good looks, Michael, and good looks. And she really loved those boys. And she always believed that they would be there for each other forever, covering each other's backs, supporting each other. Strangely enough, she always believed that, that Prince Harry, uh, good King Harry, as she called him, would be make the better king. Well, I think she was wrong there because Prince William is showing every sign of being an excellent king uh, when his turn comes. So she would be distraught to think that they are at daggers drawn as they are. Martin, it wasn't always like that. There you see them as children. They couldn't have been closer there later in life with her uh, on a happy occasion and uh, at, at their home together uh, in a beautiful springtime scene. Um, she would be terribly upset and the fact that they haven't reconciled and have no prospect of it would be upsetting her. In fact, it's maybe a mercy she can't see it. But it should be remembered that um, after the, what, the Prince and Princess of Wales, as they are now, uh, William and Catherine married in 2011, uh, Harry almost lived with them. He was in their, their, their apartments at Kensington Palace all the time. He was very close with Catherine. They got on terribly well. It was a wonderful relationship. I think maybe Prince William might have been a little bit jealous every now and then. And all that, of course, tragically changed post-Meghan. Uh, that's what's happened. And um, I'm sure were Diana looking down, as I'm sure she will be on tonight's proceedings, if she could have a wish, if she could have an award, if she could get something from this evening's proceedings, it would be some reconciliation between her two sons. But I fear, Martin, I fear that that's going to be a long way off. Michael Cole, beautifully put, emotive and wonderful words. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Michael Cole, BBC Royal Correspondent. Yeah, I just wonder what she'd think watching all this happening. Well, there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock. If Nigel Farage returned to frontline politics, would that mean oblivion for the Tories in the next general election? Well, first, it's your Ladies News headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Martin. It's 5.30. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. Michael Gove has named some of the groups to be investigated under a new definition of extremism, which she says will mean the government can express more clearly than ever who poses a risk to Britain. The groups include some with alleged Islamist views and others which are described as neo-Nazi. Today's new extremism definition will be used to assess which groups should be blocked from public funding. But the community secretary insists it's not about silencing those with private and peaceful beliefs. MPs are getting a pay rise with an inflation-busting 5.5% boost, pushing salaries up to around £91,000. It means pay will increase by more than £4,700 next year, or almost £400 extra each month. 
The Westminster watchdog says it's in line with an award for senior civil servants, but it's above inflation, which is just 4%. A review into air traffic control issues that caused widespread chaos during last August bank holiday weekend has found some engineers were working from home. Nearly 750,000 passengers were disrupted when flights were grounded at UK airports on the 28th of August. It was after National Air Traffic Services suffered a technical glitch. A report found a lack of rehearsal for an incident of its nature and scale and a significant lack of pre-planning. And the Prince of Wales has expressed concerns about the amount of time children spend on phones as he visited a youth club in London today. The Prince asked some of the children how long they spend on their phones, with one girl saying she spends up to 15 hours a day. The future King said grown-ups were also guilty of excessive screen time and said we've all got to get better at managing it. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2752 and €1.1715. The price of gold is £1,696.23 per ounce. And the FTSE 100s close the day at 7,743 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Sophia. Now, throughout the show, I've been asking for your emails. Absolutely hundreds and hundreds have come in. The top topic today is this clampdown on extremism. Karen makes an excellent point. I want to read this one out. She said here, the threat isn't coming from the far right. It's coming from the far left, as your police and crime commissioner guest said earlier. Only GB News is speaking the truth on this topic. Well, we try our best, Karen. Now, for some more common sense, I'm joined by Michelle Juby, the queen of primetime politics. Michelle, welcome to... To the show. Hello, Martin. Always a pleasure. What Indeed. you got for us tonight? Uh, well, of course, we'll be picking up on the extremism conversation too. Uh, but I also want to look at a few other things tonight as well. So, for example, uh, Halifax now, they're going to cap their mortgage uh, age rate to 70 years of age. So, should you be able to, well, don't forget, Martin, right? There's talk about increasing the retirement age in this country. So, why shouldn't you be able to push your mortgage past the age of 70 to help make life a little bit easier uh, at this moment in time? Uh, I also want ask as well. The Postmasters um, scandal, we all know about that now. The children, though, of these sub-Postmasters, they are saying as well that they want compensation for the impact it's all had on their lives, so I want to look at that. Of course, MP salaries as well. £91,000. I've got Kelvin McKenzie keeping me company tonight in Ella Whelan. One of them says that that ninety one grand is an absolute pittance. They should be paid a lot more. The other one says that they've were paid way too much money already. I'm looking forward to that debate. Superb. Jubes & Co. always has both sides of the balance. Excellent. Six or seven, that's going to be a corker as usual. Now, coming up, I'll be getting to your views on the big news of the day. GBviews at gbnews.com is the email, so please get those in ASAP. I'll read out the best. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Business News Channel. I'm Nigel Farage, and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Well, we've been a constitutional monarchy since the late 17th century. And of course, part of that deal is that the monarch, or indeed the close immediate royal family, should not interfere with politics that in any way could be seen to affect individual parties. Now, perhaps one of the most classic cases in the 20th century was Edward VIII, who during his brief reign went down to Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales, met thousands of people who'd lost their jobs in the steel industry. In fact, he shook so many hands in the end, he had to change and shake with his left hand. And he said something must be done to get these people jobs. It was taken as a direct assault on the Conservative government of the day. And we can go on to Edward Heath, as many saw it, using the Queen 
to get us to join the common market and things the Queen said uh, during the referendum on Scottish separation. And we can, of course, could talk about King Charles, who was Prince of Wales, endlessly talked about climate change and net zero. But the intervention overnight from Prince William, I think, is the most direct political, a political piece of interference that has international and global implications that I almost think we've ever seen. Prince William is saying to Israel, stop what you're doing. Some will see that as being given a free pass to Hamas. Many young people will say, hooray, he's doing the right thing. But whether he's doing the right thing or not, has he gone just too far with this? Should our future king intervene in this way. I don't believe that he should. I think he's making a very big mistake. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 5.38, we're on the final furlongs. Let's get galloping. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, could the potential return of Nigel Farage spell curtains for the Tory party? Well, if you didn't think the Conservative Party were already finished and the editor of the Sunday Telegraph, Alistair Heath, says the final blow could be dealt by my fellow GB News presenter if he dusts off his electioneering togs. Well, joining us now is the political commentator Stephen Carlton Woods. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank it must be Martin. the Conservative Party's worst nightmare. The polls are already sinking. Lee Anderson has crossed the floor to the Reform Party. Could Nigel Farage coming back in spell disaster? Well, this is pure speculation. We've been speculating since Christmas. Would Nigel Farage join the Conservative Party? And evidently, that's not the case anymore. Um, Nigel's view last October, when I spoke to him about this, he said he couldn't join a party that's not a Conservative Party. And if it ever, ever did become a Conservative Party again, he may think about it. So I think that's the end of the story with regards to Nigel Farage joining the Conservative Party. I do think there's a number of people, though, that don't care what happens with the Conservative Party as long as their agenda reaches through. And I'm talking about the left of the Conservative Party, because there is a clear left within the Conservative Party, and they don't want anyone from the right to have any influence within the party. And we've seen people over history that's been slightly to the right and they've ousted them out in one way or another. So I don't think having people from the right is the death of the Conservative Party. I think the lack of having people on the right would be the death of the Conservative Party. But Stephen, let's um, hypothesise the stage further and it's Nigel Farage not joining the Conservative Party, but coming back as the rabble rouser, the campaign manager on those open top buses across the red wall alongside people like Lee Anderson and perhaps as many as nine others crossing the floor. If all of those runes line up, Stephen, and people are going to start thinking, well, where is the real Conservative Party? It might be the Reform Party with Nigel Farage and Lee Anderson at the helm. Or is that just going to let Sakia Starmer straight into number 10? Oh, I don't know. I think we're missing out another organisation here called the Conservative Democratic Organisation. Uh, where David Campbell Bannerman's currently the chairman of that. And that's uh, another branch of the Conservatives that seem to think that uh, they need to be doing things in a different way. And they were in talks of trying to uh, get their own way some time ago, and uh, they didn't quite get the numbers of support from the right of the party. 
So you might have little bands of people. We've seen it in history before with other people doing it, like the Gang of Four that made the, that we've got the Liberal Democrats from that today. Um, so I don't think it's really going to have a long-term impact on politics, but I do think the Conservative Party needs to have a rethink of what direction they're going because uh, they seem to be hemorrhaging, uh, hemorrhaging support at the moment. Yeah, that's absolutely one way of looking at it. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Political commentator Stephen Carlton Woods. And of course, you know, Nigel is keeping his cards very close to his chest, will be none the wiser, no doubt. And he'll be in the studio pretty soon. Well, coming up, there's a 101 year old woman who's leading the fight to get what's being branded the worst, the most potholed road in England fixed. She's an absolute trooper, and we'll find out about this in just a moment. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Business News Channel. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More heavy downpours to come tomorrow. It won't rain all day. There will be some brighter spells and another pretty mild day in the south. But, uh, you know, it's not going to be completely dry when low pressure is dominating. This one's sitting right over as these weather fronts have been providing persistent rain through the day. It stays very soggy overnight across central and southern Scotland. Showers elsewhere and some decent drier spells developing over the Midlands and eastern England before more heavy showers come into Wales and southwest England through the early hours. Could be the odd rumble of thunder mixed in with that and the winds gusting up as well. A very mild night for most, but um, a bit chilly in northern Scotland where a touch of frost is just about possible. A, a cold start then with the rain over a good part of Scotland, although not as heavy as today. It stays pretty dull and damp through southeast Scotland for most of the day. Elsewhere, it'll be a case of bright spells and some showers, some heavy showers, particularly early on and then later on through the afternoon across eastern England. Some brightness, though, for Northern Ireland, west coast of Scotland, on the chilly side here, whereas in the south, again, into the teens, a bit of brightness in eastern England, could see highs of 15 or 16. Temperature dropping there on Friday night. So Saturday starts with a frost for many. I suspect much of eastern England, northern England, Scotland will stay dry on Saturday. Further west, the cloud thickening all the while with outbreaks of rain trickling in. Again, reasonably mild in the south, although don't forget, it will be a bit of a chilly start. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live, here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions, when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live, here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Earlier on Breakfast. Do you, do you think most people uh, watching this morning really care about funding for the arts? It means a lot in different parts of the country. It's too expensive to separate and get divorced, especially if you've got children. Yeah, it's probably a lot easier just to stay in that unhappy marriage and, and play yeah. away, yeah. TV News as uh, the home of free speech um, exemplifies uh, uh, an approach towards that. You invite on people uh, to your shows who you may and your viewers may violently disagree with, but you think it's important to hear every side of the argument. From six, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. 5.45 is your time. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, the latest research by Facts for EU has revealed that nearly half of NHS staff are not even clinically qualified. 
further adding to the health service's bloated bureaucracy. Meanwhile, doctor numbers are up by 19% despite Brexit at the claims that doctors from the EU would flood out of the country if we voted to leave. Another bit of project fear that never materialised. Well, I can now speak with NHS doctor Basha Mukherjee, who joins us on the show. Welcome to the show, Basha. It's always an absolute pleasure. So the first part of this report is um, rather concerning, and that is almost half of NHS staff now aren't medically qualified, clearly meaning that they're bureaucrats, pen pushers. Is that really the way that we should be going? I think by the state of the NHS currently, that is a, a number that we should be pulling into question. Um, and I think, therefore, the you know, if the patients are the core audience that we're treating, we really need to look at the number of clinical recruits that we're making. And we often hear about the um, the massive salaries, Basher, of some of the bureaucrats, the NHS trust chiefs. And again, it begs the question, have we lost priorities? Should we be spending that money on much-needed frontline staff rather than pen pushers in the back room? As a frontliner myself, as a clinical clinically clinical staff myself, I would 100% back that, definitely, just because... Um, we are ultimately treating patients. So considering the waiting list that we have currently, considering the state of our A&Es, I would 100% think that the priority needs to be put on the front line. In fact, I would push for the priority to be on prevention, where the budget is moved more towards primary care. Currently, there's 8% of the whole NHS budget that is put towards primary care, whereas we look after so many patients. And Basha, the part one of, the, of this report yesterday revealed that we have had a 42.6% increase in the number of NHS staff members over the past decade. Um, and yet we're still seeing, despite record investment going in, £182 billion last year, an extra £6 billion in the spring budget, we're still seeing record waiting lists of £7.7 7 million. Does that not suggest that the system is broken and it needs an overhaul? I think we also have to think about that just because we have recruited more does not necessarily mean that the quality of the recruits can be spoken for. Or we're not even taking into consideration the, the number of people who are leaving the NHS who are on sick leave, which has significantly gone up since pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. It's almost doubled. And actually, you know, we are seeing those, those factors make, make a big part of the problem. And do you think that um, we might approach a time where that we're allowed to have a conversation about restructuring the NHS rather than treating it as something where, which is sacred, which cannot be looked upon? What about looking at a more progressive system, such as the, the type we see in Germany, where those who can afford to go private should be perhaps encouraged to do so, relieving the burden for those who are unable to afford that down the food chain? 100%, the NHS 100% needs reform and, you know, we should never be scared of change. But unfortunately, we are very much living in the short term, even with the government, they only last five years at a time and no government wants to potentially make, rejig the whole system and potentially deal with the consequences of that. The short term consequences are all we can think about at the moment. But actually, we really need to really restructure the whole thing. And I really think that the, the way the budgeting is done at the minute, the amount of waste that is there. We need to look at those factors rather than thinking about how much more money we can put in, how many more recruits of staff we can do. We have to think about working with what we have and using the resources better. Well, you're, you're speaking absolute common sense there. It's always a pleasure to speak to you, and that's NHS doctor Basha Mukherjee. Thank you so much for joining us on GB News. Excellent. Now to the story of the 101-year-old woman who's leading the fight to get what's been branded the most potholed road in England fixed. Sheila Nichols, who's an absolute legend, lives in the small town of Watchit in Somerset. And the local council has told her and her fellow campaigners it's not their responsibility to mend these holes. Our South West of England reporter Jeff Moody has this report. They call it the most potholed road in England. There are 21 of these holes just on this tiny stretch of road alone, and some of them are really quite deep. A hazard for many, a serious danger to the elderly. 
Sheila Nichols is 101. She's one of Somerset's oldest residents and she lives on the street with her husband, Bill. I do feel frightened. If it's too difficult for the people on the job to, to do anything about it, we know we can't do anything about it. So it's almost as if you're... You're at a, a point... Yeah, it's hopeless. About, yes, completely hopeless. Someone's going to get really hurt. Someone's going to get some damage to their car. And then we, we'll, it'll be a state where we won't be able to use the road. It's serious. That's still very serious. Bill and Sheila have been campaigning for months, writing to the council, raising awareness of the state of the road outside their front door, along with their neighbours. I mean, we got up a petition um, last June. Everyone signed it and we sent it off to the council. We didn't hear a word. So, you know, not even a, no, we're not doing anything, or yes, we are doing anything, just nothing. That's your old fault. Uh, and I think that you can say that about potholes, but these are extra special deluxe potholes. A spokesman for Somerset Council says whilst there are some potholes, the lane carries a public footpath which is still accessible for walkers. This lane is a public right-of-way, not a public road. Therefore, the responsibility for the upkeep of this lane is complex and there will need to be a shared approach to maintenance going forward. Residents claim six people have already been injured as a result of the potholes. The hope is something can be done before anybody else gets hurt. But with no one quite knowing who's responsible for maintaining the road, it's unlikely anything will be done any time soon. Jeff Moody, GB News. What an absolute legend Sheila Nichols is. 101 years old. I don't know what she's drinking in her tea. She looks younger than me. My, that's not saying much. And Bill, superb. The whole community coming together and saying enough is enough to the council. How dare they say it's not their responsibility and they're putting it on pensioners to lead the charge. Good on them. Excellent. That's what we need, the very best of British. Now, I've got a quick time to blast through some emails you've been sending them in throughout the show. Connor says this on extremism, an excellent email. We can't solve the housing crisis. We can't fix the NHS. We can't get people off benefits. We can't stop the boats. We can't stop the disgraceful waste in public spendings. And we can't even fix the potholes. But we can spend our precious time arguing over what does or doesn't count as extremism. Connor, you've hit the nail on the head. Brilliant point of the same topic. Um, Keith simply says, we want our country back, echoing the words there of a certain Lee Anderson. And Sally says this, what are far-right extremists? Because that's what we've been called all along, simply for voting Brexit. Got a quick email here on um, MPs getting a 5% pay rise. That's been getting an above inflation rise when I can't even afford food on my plate. I thought they were supposed to be there for us, the tax paying public, not for themselves. And I think that is a great point. They're raking it in while we're having thin gruel. Look, I'm going to knock off at this point. Um, I've been here three till six. After this is Michelle Jubry, six till seven p.m. But first, it's time for your latest weather with Alex Deegan. Have a fantastic evening. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More heavy downpours to come tomorrow. It won't rain all day. There will be some brighter spells and another pretty mild day in the south. But, uh, you know, it's not going to be completely dry when low pressure is dominating. This one's sitting right over as these weather fronts have been providing persistent rain through the day. It stays very soggy overnight across central and southern Scotland. Showers elsewhere and some decent drier spells developing over the Midlands and eastern England before more heavy 
heavy showers coming to Wales and southwest England through the early hours. Could be the odd rumble of thunder mixed in with that and the winds gusting up as well. A very mild night for most, but um, a bit chilly in northern Scotland where a touch of frost is just about possible. A, a cold start then with the rain over a good part of Scotland, although not as heavy as today. It stays pretty dull and damp through southeast Scotland for most of the day. Elsewhere, it'll be a case of bright spells and some showers, some heavy showers, particularly early on and then later on through the afternoon across eastern England. Some brightness, though, for Northern Ireland, west coast of Scotland, on the chilly side here, whereas in the south, again, into the teens, a bit of brightness in eastern England. Could see highs of 15 or 16. Temperature dropping there on Friday night. So Saturday starts with a frost for many. I suspect much of eastern England, northern England, Scotland will stay dry on Saturday. Further west, the cloud thickening all the while with outbreaks of rain trickling in. Again, reasonably mild in the south, although don't forget, it will be a bit of a chilly start. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner? You've won £18,000. I'm slipping it. I don't know what to say. Enter our massive spring giveaway with three big seasonal prizes to be won. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello there, it's six o'clock and I'm Michelle Jubri. Coming up tonight, we have a new definition of extremism and a list of groups that are currently being reviewed against it. I can tell you now, opinion is divided and many are absolutely furious. So I'm asking you, is all of this a step in the right direction? or not. And MPs will be getting a pay rise, taking their salary to a whopping £91,000 a year. Not bad work if you can get it, is it? One of my panellists says this is way too low. The other one says it's way too high. What says you?
And Halifax is going to impose 70 years old as an age limit on many of their mortgages. What do you think to this? Is it a good move, the right one, or not? And we've all followed the Post Office Horizon scandal, haven't we? All the sub-purse masters fighting for compensation. Now, though, many of their children are seeing 